Good evening, everyone. Today is Monday, April 19th, 2021. This is the regular meeting of the Asbury Park Planning Board. It is 7.05 p.m. And um, Barbara, will you please call us to order? Yes, uh, the meeting will be called to order. Uh, the following meeting, um, well, actually, the date is April, 20, April 19th, uh, 7 p.m. The following meeting is being conducted by electronic means in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, amended 2020, which explicitly permits a public body to conduct meetings electronically during a state of emergency. Adequate notice of this meeting has been conducted or has been provided to the Coaster and Asbury Park Press. All notices are on file with the board secretary. In addition, a notice regarding this virtual meeting and instructions were published in the Asbury Park Press and the City of Asbury Park website. A copy of this notice is on file with the board secretary. The notices and conduct of this meeting are in accordance with the guidelines of virtual meetings issued by the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. All microphones for public users are muted until the public question or comment period. If you would like to speak during this time, please use the raise hand button in Zoom or on your computer, on your computer or dial star nine on your telephone. Your name or last four digits of your phone number will be called when it's your turn to speak. If at any time during your question you are deemed to be out of line or topic, we reserve the right to mute your microphone and we will make an announcement that this has occurred. During the public comment session only, the public will have three minutes to speak. Please turn off all cell phones and electronic devices during the meeting. Please identify yourself before you speak. This meeting is being recorded and will be available to view via APTV. Uh, and also, one thing I'd like to also add, if there are any derogatory, derogatory comments uh, towards public uh, the planning board members uh, or any of the professionals or, um, or the applicant, uh, we reserve the right to mute you um, pretty much immediately. Um, all right, please join me for the salute of the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag, the flag of the United States, States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and I will now take roll. Mayor John Moore is absent. Councilwoman Avon Clayton is also absent. Michael Manzella is also absent. Jim Henry. Here. Jennifer Souter. Here. Trudy Syfax is also absent this evening. Alexis Taylor. Here. Eric Gallipo. Here. Rick Lambert. Here. And Barbara Krizan. Here. Thank you, everyone. Okay, the... Um... We have the minutes of April 5th, uh, the regular meeting. Can I get a motion to uh, to pass the, uh, the minutes unless someone has a comment? I'll make a motion. This is Jen Souter, a motion to accept the minutes. Who will second? second? I'll second. Thank you. I have a motion by Jennifer Souter and a second by Barbara Krizza. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Minutes approved. All right. The next item up on the agenda is the, uh, the council referral of amendments to the Asbury Park Main Street Redevelopment Plan. Uh, at this point, what we have found uh, was that the documentation for this portion uh, was not available on the website to the public in time. So we are going to be asking to carry this to uh, the next meeting. And what is that meeting, uh, Irina? What is the date? The next meeting date is May 3rd of 2021. Okay. So are we uh, can I get a motion to carry? Barbara, the... can I make a comment before we uh, uh, go into the motion? Sure. Okay. I looked at this. Um, uh, resolution quite carefully. And number one, the summary that was submitted uh, is not, it, the location is uh, incorrect in the summary 
of this resolution. That's number one. Number two, the certification uh, made, was made 13 days before the resolution was finalized. Number three, uh, the 45 day period within which we are supposed to uh, prepare a report has already lapsed by about three to five weeks, depending on which date you happen to choose. Uh, number four, the resolution was not approved by the council. It only got one affirmative vote. Uh, number five, the resolution changes the building height. So that is something that needs to be reviewed. Um, and if this resolution goes forward, I'd like to know why uh, we are only including the uh, one property. Or, uh, because if you look at the properties on that street, the property immediately adjacent to it on the east is a single family or is a is a home? I don't know how many family, but adjacent to that on the east is another vacant lot. Why aren't we including that vacant lot in the same uh, category as the vacant lot that we're discussing in this resolution? To me, to me, that smacks of uh, spot zoning, and I don't think that that is permitted. And we need to take a look at this. And this whole thing needs to be revisited. Well, what, what I would suggest is that, I mean, it's good that you brought up those points. And I think that we should have that discussion with Michelle before it comes back so that we can have all the answers to your questions prior to that. Thank you. Uh, would that be okay? Yeah. I'll ask, I'll ask Michelle to get together and we can review what your concerns are. And if anybody else has any concerns, we would prefer to have them before they come to this meeting so we can, um, so that we can resolve them uh, appropriately. So if anybody else would like to join us in that discussion, please let me know. Uh, you can just send me an email, text, whatever, or you can tell me right now if you'd like to be in that discussion. Okay, I guess then it'll be Jim and myself. Um, I'd, I'd also like to join. Sorry. I'm All sorry. right. So it's Eric, Jim, and Barbara and Michelle. Okay. We'll make a, we'll have a meeting before this, before, certainly before the third, um, and, uh, and have that discussion. Okay. All right. So um, I still would like to get a motion to carry it to the third uh, at, in whatever whatever condition it's going to, to land in. Uh, and obviously if it has to go back to council, then obviously that date will have to change, but I'd rather get it on the calendar versus not having it on the calendar at all, if that's okay. So this is Alexis motion to carry to May 3rd. Yes. I'll second it. All right, I have a motion by Alexis Taylor and a second by Barbara Kurzak to carry to May 3rd. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Application or discussion, I should say, carried to May 3rd, 2021. Okay. All right, then our, um, our application that's up today is uh, AP Shore Holdings, um, Main Street, 810 to 812 Main Street. Um, Mr. Beekman? Uh, excuse me, before we proceed to Mr. Beekman, Madam Chairwoman, I've reviewed the file and all the notices that were supplied, they're all in proper form and we were timely filed and served and published. So we have jurisdiction to proceed this evening. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Jeffrey Beekman of the Beekman Law Firm, Ocean Grove, New Jersey. I represent the applicant, AP Shore Holdings, LLC. Um, uh, on the uh, virtual hearing tonight, I have our architect, Dan Cond Conditore. Uh, we have our engineer, uh, Matthew Wilder. We have our planner, Brian Leff, uh, as well as my client, uh, Hamil Con Conwandala. Um, 
you will note that uh, the application is uh, on uh, 810-812 Main Street. Uh, it's an L-shaped lot uh, that uh, fronts both Main Street as well as uh, First Avenue. Uh, and, the, and the proposal tonight is a uh, conforming use and that is for a ground floor commercial um, space, one, one unit and four residential units above, which is consistent with the, the zone and the master plan. Um, we're gonna start with Mr. Condittori as our first witness, and then we'll proceed to Mr. Wilder and then Mr. Leff. All right, um, I would also like to ask that um, special attention is played to, because I see that there is a total of, uh, between variances and design exceptions, there are a total of 10 here. And to be quite honest with you and Frank, I see that some of these, I don't really understand why they're even here and why they would be an issue for them to be resolved before they even come here. So I would like to understand when you have your discussions with your professionals, your presentations from the applicants that, can't we just like knock some of these out because it, it I'm sorry, just mechanical screening? Really? Well, we, we will knock those. Mechanical we'll, screening? We will knock a couple of these, these out very quickly because there seemed to be a, uh, a problem between a prior uh, plan that was submitted and the, the more recent one that was submitted. Uh, okay. But some, some of those variances also deal with the fact that the, the lot itself is split by two zones. Right. So it's not related to an adjoining property. It's actually related within the actual property. It's no, kind of- no, I, I understand some of those where we have to have that discussion, but things like mechanical screening, screening of trash storage, why are they even here? That's what I'm saying. So that's why let's knock those out as quickly as possible so we don't have to waste that time. Sure. So go forward. Okay, uh, I'll introduce, I, I don't know, uh, Jack, do you wanna swear everyone in or? Well, we'll swear in each one as they go. We'll, we'll uh, swear in Dan okay. uh, as the architect, but I'll also swear in Michael Sullivan and Jason in case they have to jump in on the discussion. And then as each one of your witnesses come up, I'll swear them in. That sounds great, thank you. Okay, where's Mr. Contador? I, okay, Dan, please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony about the given this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, please state your name for the record, spell it, and tell us uh, in what capacity you are testifying this evening. Sure, uh, my name is Daniel Condator. that's C-O-N-D-A-T-O-R-E. I am the owner of Mode Architects located in Asbury Park. I'll be providing architectural representation for my client tonight. I've uh, appeared in this board in front of the zoning board in Asbury Park several times. Sure. And Madam Chairman, we'll accept uh, Dan's credentials? Yes. Okay. If I may, before we start with your testimony, let's get uh, Michael Sullivan and Jason Fisher to raise their right hands for me, please. Thank you, gentlemen. Solemnly swear the testimony about the given this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay, please state your names for the record, spell them, and tell us your affiliation with the board. Michael uh, Sullivan, Clark Caton Hints, S U L L I V A N, board planner. Thank you. Jason Fitchter, Inside Engineering, board engineer. And that's F I C H T E R, correct? That's correct. Okay, uh, Mr. Beekman, take it away. Thank you. Uh, and as far as the plans, uh, all of the plans that we'll be referring to tonight have been submitted to the board. Um, so I don't know if you have to mark anything since they've already been submitted. Or, as far as I know, I don't think we have anything new to submit. We just uh, ha I have one colored rendering that I'll be sharing. And that, right that colored, the yeah. colored rendering, Dan, that's, that's exactly the same plan that you submitted. We submitted a couple weeks ago. Is that correct? It's a part, well, we submitted the plans. We didn't have a colored rendering at the time. Right. What Was it submitted at least 48 hours before tonight's meeting? No, it was not. Okay, then we cannot accept it today. Okay. Did you submit a black and white plan? <laughs> we, have the we have the elevations and floor plans th that were submitted on time, yes. So all you're doing is you want to submit something that's already been submitted. You just cut, made it uh, a color rendering. Well, it's a 3D rendering and not a 2D elevation. Okay. It, it's, it, I, I'll work without it. And then, I mean, Fine. okay, we have to submit okay. one at a later date, we can. Okay. 
Okay. So, uh, Dan, you, uh, you've been hired by um, the client in order to prepare the architectural plans. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, your latest plan is dated um, March 31, 2021? That's correct. And in that plan, let's, let's deal first with the, um, the screening of the HVAC. Um, your, your prior plan, which had a date and, and was submitted uh, with a revision date of 9-30-20, that showed the, um, the screening for the HVAC equipment. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we had originally submitted it, and then based on responding to some the original planning comments, um, somehow uh, graphical error, that screening was turned off on the submission and we didn't pick it up, but uh, the mechanical units will be screened. Um, I do have that earlier submission, which was submitted in the original application that has that screening. I can always pull that up and reference that to show you, um, but that was just a, a graphical error within the, the, the printing of the documents. Okay. Um, Mr. Beekman? Yes. Uh, who is going to be sharing the uh, documents that you're speaking about? Uh, if if our experts, as they each testify, uh, if you're okay with doing so, is that all right? Yes. Yeah. Dan? Yes. So, if you, you know, Dan, if you can just um, show that prior drawing that was submitted. Uh, remember, we originally had a hearing scheduled for the March hearing. Correct. Submitted uh, let me pull that up. Okay, this is the original submission. This is not the current submission, but I will show you. Uh, everybody can see my screen, I'm assuming, at this point? Yes. Yes. Okay. So during the original submission, this is the rooftop plan. And here is the mechanical area and the screening that was proposed for it. Um, here are elevations uh, in the rear and the front, and you can see that screening. And then for some reason, it, like I said, it was a mistake. Um, it says mechanical enclosure, but the, for some reason that enclosure did not print on the current plans, but it is there and we will be screening. Uh, and if you can go to A103, the elevations. Oh, that is 103. Yeah, that was 103. Uh, A200 rather. A200, you can actually see the mechanical units shown here. They're not screened. Yeah, so so that's where they are, and we're not we're not proposing them to be in any other location, right? They're still going to remain on the. Yes, road. yes. So let's talk about your design, Dan, and what's being proposed here, uh, as far as let's go floor by floor. Of course, sure, absolutely. As you know, um, from uh, being in this is a part of the Main Street uh, redevelopment area, mm. and currently as a property sits, it's basically a void. Um, in the main street uh, streetscape. Um, what we're proposing to do is infill that void with a, uh, a mixed use building with retail at the, the ground floor and two levels of um, two floors of residential, which we feel is consistent with the scale and scope of other buildings along main street. Uh, what I have here is on sheet A100 is the uh, ground floor plan uh, that indicates uh, you know, the recess entry for our retail area. Uh, we have approximately 950 square foot of retail. And then on the north side, uh, we have a, a residential entry, which also uh, has a hallway that connects through and the residents can enter uh, also from the parking lot in the back. And then we also have a, um, a service door for the retail in the back. Uh, and then behind the building, uh, is the parking field, which this is just for graphic purposes. Uh, I, you know, Matt, our civil engineer, will talk more about the parking layout and arrangement uh, and that connection to the building. Um, one thing that's important to note, uh, you can see here on the outline, the second floor, the residential floors do uh, cantilever, or not cantilever, but they do go over the parking area. So, what we did is we pushed this retail as far as to the front as we could uh, to allow area for parking and, and the trash and other uh, services that are, are, are needed behind the building. So uh, that's the basic first floor layout. Before you go on to the next mm -hmm. floor, Dan, just yep. a couple quick questions. So sure. it, it looks like there's a lot of extra space in there. 
uh, on your plans. But yeah, um, in that th there's a, a, a fairly I wouldn't say significant, but there's a slope from the back to the front of this site. Is that correct? That is correct. There is some ramping and some steps that are required uh, that are shown on the civil plans that re that bring us to the level uh, of the retail space and the uh, entrance lobby for the residential. So while it looks somewhat empty underneath this parking garage area, there are actually amenities there that that get you from the level where the parking area is to the level of that first floor. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. OK, thank you. If you can proceed with the second floor. So this, this is the second floor unit layout. So our basic uh, unit layout uh, on each floor is the same. Uh, we have a one bedroom unit on, on the plan on the left here that uh, is on the main street side. And then towards the rear, the east side of the building, we have a, a two bedroom unit with a den. Um, you know, we're trying to provide, you know, uh, modestly, you know, spaces with large living rooms. Uh, we have multiple bed bedrooms, a master bedroom. Um, so the, the, the one bedroom units are approximately 750 square feet. And then on the uh, two bedroom units, we're showing uh, approximately 1400 square feet. Um, so the, and on the north side, we have our stairwell, which as you come around, you would loop up and go to the, the, the third floor above. Um, and I can show you those. Those are the, the same as. Before you go to the third floor, let's mm -hmm. just talk a little bit more. All right. So one of the comments in the in the um, review letters was about uh, storage mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, amenities associated with storage and, and other things. If you could just explain what you have laid out for that. Sure. So within the units, we feel that we, you know, have enough internal storage. Uh, we have uh, you know, a closet off of the great room. This den office space would be additional storage to accommodate the two bedrooms. Uh, we have uh, closets in the bedrooms and in the living space for the, the one bedroom. So we felt like based on the size of the units, we were providing uh, an adequate amount of storage and closets. Okay. And that storage is, is in the units themselves, correct? It's in the units themselves. Yes. Okay. Thank you. If you could proceed to the third. Oh, so uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are we saying that the storage is in the den? Well, there, there could be storage within the den. The den is a flexible space that can be used also as storage if it the, the homeowner, you know, chooses to do that. Okay. So, so, so there's only the, in the bedroom, there's a closet. In the two bedrooms, there are closets. And the den could be yeah, we have big storage area. We have, we have a walk-in closet for the one master bedroom. We have a, a general closet in the great room, and then the individual bedroom has a closet, and then the den space can also uh, compensate more storage. Okay. Okay. This is exactly the same layout um, as below. Um, and then these stairs do continue up to the roof. Uh, so you can see the stairs coming up on the roof plan that lead to a door. And then we have a small uh, roof area that we'll be putting a elevated deck system, pedestal system with a guardrail uh, just to provide some outdoor space for the residents. And then uh, behind that, which is obviously not shown on this plan, which we just discussed earlier is uh, the mechanical units. Um, we have, Parapets on three sides. We have parapets facing uh, Main Street on the east, and we have parapets uh, on the north and southerly facades. And then uh, the roof will slope back towards the rear, where we would have a gutter along the back uh, east wall uh, into downspouts will be connected to the storm system. And what about, um, so, so looking at a103, the left mm -hmm. side is facing Main Street. Yes. Correct. And the right side is to the rear of the building. Correct. So the mechanicals are situated towards the rear of the building. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And also the even the, the roof deck itself is held back adequately as to not uh, you know, wouldn't be visible from uh, Main Street. Right. 
the, the step back uh, area for the roof deck. How mm -hmm. do you access the mechanicals from the roof deck? Uh, we would provide a gate. Uh, it's probably, we can add that to the plan. So when that person, uh, the stairwell that connects to the, the uh, amenity area roof deck, uh, we'd be able to provide a gate that they'd be able to step onto the main roof to get to the mechanicals. Okay. And, and the entrance uh, is kind of towards the central uh, of the, of the building entrance to the roof deck. Yes. Yeah. What's and it's not, a, it's not a square. You'll see on the elevation is that it's not a square bulkhead. We slope that roof as to, you know, further kind of uh, eliminate the scale or the massing uh, that might be visible from the street. Okay. So towards the east, it's actually lower than, than towards the west? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and what's the treatment for the east? Um, all, all facades are gonna be covered in uh, you know, a brick uh, material. So that brick material will somewhat match, uh, the brick material facing east towards Main Street will somewhat match what's uh, proposed on Main Street? Yes, that's correct. And then also um, to the south and north, that's actually going to be adjoining those two buildings on either side, correct? Yes. And what is visible, we'll, we'll put a brick veneer on, on those areas. Okay. And you, you mentioned uh, about the gutters. Uh, so just what, what is the plan associated with gutters to collect roof uh, water? So it's just, it's a straightforward, um, you know, a shed roof. So it'll, it'll, the building will slope east to west um, or west to east to that gutter. And then we'll have downspouts that will uh, eventually connect to the uh, um, the ground. I don't uh, and be drained to the grade of the parking area. I believe. Okay, so we're not we're we're not planning on running any of that drainage towards Main Street. No. Okay. All right. Uh, if you can go to the elevations, let's let's talk about the. Um, the west elevation facing Main Street. And if you can just describe what the treatments uh, and what's being proposed. Yeah, what we're proposing here is a, a more a traditional storefront um, in a downtown kind of architecture. Um, we have our, uh, you know, a base to the building where we're using a, you know, a charcoal uh, uh, colored paneling system. And then we have a, a dental um, cornice uh, above the storefront area where we have a space for signage. Uh, we have, uh, you know, separate uh, separation between the glazing of the retail and then the glazing uh, entrance to the residential. Um, and along that facade, we have a, a traditional style um, lantern like wall sconce to provide some accent lighting along that facade. Uh, the upper part or the, uh, the residential levels <coughs> will be a brick facade and we'll be treating the other window heads and the window sills with a, with a rollout uh, uh, coursing of brick. And then at the top of the parapet, we have our, our, another decorative cornice feature uh, with some dental work. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is, you know, allow much light into the, the storefront as possible. Uh, we're creating uh, a rhythm at the street front with a mix of the brick pilasters and then the, the breaking up of the windows with uh, additional uh, piers at the entrance. So the entrance is centered here along the storefront. And then we're breaking out the horizontal with, a um, you know, a horizontal mullion above the, uh, of the doors to create a transom level. So, you know, it's to us, it's a, a traditional style uh, architecture for a downtown. And, you know, we feel that it fits in with um, uh, the Main Street kind of uh, Main Street theme and what, what is, you know, uh, happening in town. Um, the one, one of the questions that did come up, and I think it's a question I can happy to discuss with the planner, is uh, the requirement for glazing, 70% uh, uh, glazing is required at the um, street front level. Um, it's noted in the planner's report that we're at 60%. Um, I, I guess my question would be, you know, exactly, I think we're just off on our math and calculation uh, from, from our standpoint. Uh, we calculated that number from the top of the window uh, area uh, down to the street which gave us a number that was uh, slightly above 70%. Uh, 
And I believe that he most likely took that math from the top of this uh, uh, decorative panel, which would put us um, below the 70%. Uh, so I think there's a bit of a discrepancy in how we each calculate it. And I'd be happy to, to work that out. Um, I, I, I think you can see from the elevation, we do have a pretty uh, substantial amount of glass along that streetscape. So I don't know if that's something that is needs to be adjusted or we, we think it's, it's fine the way it is, but we'd be happy to, to visit that, revisit that and, and, and come to some kind of agreement on the percentage of glazing along the storefront. Dan, can you just move your um, uh, plan a little bit to the left or yeah, that, that's better. That way? So there's, Sorry. there's just, just to go along with your testimony there, there's a line that's that uh, demarcates uh, level two. Yeah. So is that, what, what does that line represent? So that would be the finished floor of the, that'd be the finished floor of uh, the level two. And then the top of the glazing. So the glazing really would go, would be at the ceiling of our retail. So that's where we felt that we were raising the gla glazing to the ceiling. So that was our datum for determining the amount of glass along the street front. Um, but, you know, I'm happy to discuss that further. It's Alternatively, um, we're, we're e either asking for a design waiver or asking for a review of the calculation to determine whether what we're proposing is accurate. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it looks like, as you indicated, there's a pretty significant amount of uh, glass and transparent glass as well. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. It's transparent glass. Okay. So, so the plan really is to, uh, to be in keeping with what would be normal. And, and there's not a lot of room other than possibly removing some of those decorative features within the, the panes. Yeah. We'd have to either thin the pilasters or the brick, uh, uh, pilasters, which I feel are right now, you know, proportioned accurately. Okay. So, um, so in other words, you will comply. Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I don't will, want to put words in your mouth. No, I, I'm willing to work with the math to see where the number is with the planner. We'll try to comply if it's, if it, if, um, you know, if we need to comply, I'm sure I, I can make it work. I'm, I'm comfortable with the elevation as it is. If, 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 you know, uh, you know, the board's comfortable with the way the design is. So this is, this is Michael Sullivan, Madam Chair. Can I just pop in yeah. here for a second? Go for it. Um, I think that um, it's, a, it's an interesting point that's been raised here with respect to the method of calculating it and whether or not that would be reflective of the internal space and the limits of the internal space versus what you see on the outside of the building elevation. I think that for tonight, what I would like to do is circle back with the with the zoning officer and the planning office and see if there's been any precedential determinations with respect to this, because it hasn't come up previously as as to how this is measured and see if there's been any any determination previously. Saying that, I think that um, there isn't it there is an expansive amount of glass here for this area of the building. And I think that if the if the board feels from a visual perspective uh, whether or not you think there should be more glass, um, then you should say so, um, regardless of where those calculations ultimately will end up. Um, but I don't think we're going to be able to determine tonight what the accurate calculation methodology is. Um, but I will um, circle back with the zoning office to find out. Um, this is Eric Gallipo. Um is there any uh, requirement or um, uh, regulation for the glazing above the first floor? Well, we haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> so we're, we're treating the first floor like we'd like to discuss that issue and then okay. address the second floor if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so just going back, I, I, my question to Mr. Conditori was if, if, uh, if there's any area where you can expand the glass, it, it doesn't appear that you'd be able to expand the glass upwards. Is that accurate? 
We wouldn't that that is accurate. We wouldn't be able to go vertically higher. No. Okay. So so it be, be and that's because the ceiling of that first floor would not allow you to do that because obviously you need the floor uh, joists and and those things in order to construct the dwelling or that's to correct the building. Um. So I, my point is, you feel that what's being shown is is quite appropriate uh, from an architectural standpoint and a pretty significant amount of class. Is that correct? That's correct. And in your opinion, from an architectural standpoint and knowing the main street uh, street fronts, uh, do you feel that what's being shown is proportionally um, accurate from an architectural standpoint? Yes, I, I believe it is, yes. Um, so if the calculation is less than 70%, ultimately, whatever that decision is, we would still be asking for a waiver based upon what your design is today. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about, as, as we're uh, still dealing with that first floor, you, you mentioned the sconces. Uh, let's talk about the, um, uh, the residential entryway and what's being proposed associated with that entryway. Sure, so uh, what we did at the residential entry was, was recess the entry to provide uh, a bit of cover as you enter the door. Uh, we've introduced the building number or the address at the entrance. Um, we felt that, you know, we're not gonna name the building as far as a residential building. So the, uh, the street number itself would identify the, the residence. So we felt that was uh, a simple enough um, uh, solution without uh, overstating itself. And you're proposing the trim above the uh, glass area for the commercial space with a, a sign. And that, and that sign that we're proposing would comply with the sign ordinance. Is that accurate? We lose you, Dan. We may have lost him. Yeah, Dan. Not sure what happened. Yeah, do you want to give him a call? Yeah, I'm going to give him a call. We lose you. Okay, all right. That's okay. <laughs> He's coming back on. Well, that was a first for me, everybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know if you what you heard, but um, so if you can share your yep. screen again. And we were talking about the retail sign above. Um, what we're proposing there is, uh, would comply with the sign ordinance. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes. And what and what type of treatment is that uh, that band that's above the retail and the uh, residential entryway? Uh, it's just a um, like a cornice dental work that will will you know have uh, some detail to it um, that will be applied basically to the facade. And let's talk about the treatments of the windows and the upper levels mm -hmm. um, in connection with the planning reports as well. Sure. Yeah, from my review of the planning report, the overall glazing, there is a requirement on the overall glazing for the facade as a whole, which we comply with. Uh, the requirement is 30% and we are at 
Okay. Um, and then co colors, what colors are you proposing for the, the brick treatment and the... We're, we're proposing a traditional uh, red brick um, with some variation in it, in the color. Okay. And are there any other lights on that front facade other than those sconces? No, there's not. Okay. What about lighting at the, um, the roof level? Uh, we would propose, and I need to clarify that with uh, civil is we would have a, uh, basically um, a light where the stairwell uh, exits onto the roof. We would have a wall mounted fixture that would shine light onto the roof area, onto the, the roof deck area. Okay. And that, that lighting wouldn't uh, spill onto any adjoining property? No, and we'll work on that uh, to, to verify. I know that wasn't an initial uh, lighting study, but we will um, coordinate that to make sure it doesn't and it complies. Okay. And how, and, and we'll, we'll get a little more in depth uh, with the engineer on this, but how about um, uh, trash uh, pickup and how that's uh, proposed as far as the architectural design? Um, I mean, in, as far as the operations, we do have the two, um, we have the service doors in the back and entries in the back. Uh, there will be a, 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 a maintenance uh, company that takes care of the building as a whole. Um, you know, uh, the residents themselves would walk their trash down the stairs and then there would be um, a trash area with several uh, trash cans that they can place their recyclings in their trash material. Uh, the stores themselves would, would also do that. And then um, on pickup days, uh, these would have be the cans that have some wheels on them where they can be brought out to the street for pickup. Um, there would be no large dumpster. It would be uh, multiple uh, maneuverable uh, uh, trash bins. And um, the, management, the, the management company would handle? Yeah, they, they'd handle bringing the trash out to the street. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you can you show me on this on these plans where where is that? I, I do not have I do not have it on my plans. It's it's addressed on this the site plans. Okay. So fine. Uh, if it's addressed somewhere else, we can cover it then. Yes. And that's addressed on that first floor, that that open area where the, the parking deck is, correct? Correct. That's in that area. Okay. Um, and what about the, the comments related to the building rhythm? Uh, particularly as it as it relates to Main Street. Yeah, so when we looked at the 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 building elevation in itself and the width of the building and um, uh, the actual streetscape, I mean, there's a lot of different architecture along the streetscape and the way the infill amount of this building. Um, I just we just felt during the design process that um, you know the rhythm at the street level was, was, was kind of the driver, but from the upper floors, um, we kind of wanted to uh, keep it simplistic and, and just have a more traditional brick facade um, with the, 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 the detail at the window heads and the sills. And we didn't introduce uh, breaking up um, the length of the building uh, 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 with any other further rhythm. Uh, the building with itself is 40 feet, which we felt was, um, not a very large expanse for, uh, um, you know, a residential building. And the comment of, of uh, the rhythm being side to side rhythm of approximately 25 to 35 feet, in, in your opinion, at 40 feet? Yeah, we felt that. Was, you know, difference? Yeah, uh, that's, that's exactly right. Okay. Um, and the, the treatments along that facade provide some of that breakup in lieu of the side to side rhythm, correct? Correct. We're, you know, we focus the more of the rhythm oriented to the pedestrian level. So we felt that really, you know, between the glass and the brick piers uh, broke up that facade. And you also identified the difference between the commercial space uh, and vertically between the commercial and the residential space. Yes. Yes. By, you know, by having the, the, the residential entry uh, have the two brick uh, pilot stairs on each side. Okay. Uh, there's a comment in here about uh, green building design. Um, can you just talk about some of the, the features that 
you envision the building having? Sure. I mean, I think from a, a green, there's nothing specific um, as far as we're tr trying to achieve a certain goal, but uh, just we're going to use the best uh, modern building techniques as far as efficiency of mechanical equipment and LED lighting, uh, temperature control, and things of that nature. Um, you talked a little bit about the site lighting. Uh, what lighting is proposed underneath the garage area? Uh, we have a couple, uh, uh, we'll have some down fixtures and, uh, in the ceiling of the, uh, where the, where the building goes over the parking. And then I know that, uh, we coordinating with civil, he's got some, uh, wall mounted fixtures and some bollards that cover the area outside the building. Okay. Um, and, and you, uh, do, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do we see that somewhere? Where would we see that? The, the lighting plan for um, on the civil set has the lighting in the rear of the building. Okay. So we'll talk about that later then. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Correct. Any of the lighting in the interior in the parking garage, again, that, you don't envision that spilling into any of the neighboring properties? No, no. Great. Um, I think those are all the questions I have for Mr. Condator. Do our, um, are, are we going to go through the planner's report? I was I'm actually sorry, going... Mr. I'm sorry, is Mr. Condator the planner? No. No, I'm not. Okay, then we'll wait. Yeah, we, have a, we do have a planner who will address okay. those issues. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I believe I addressed the building issues that are related in the report. All, All right. right. So, um, so do we have any comments uh, about the limited storage that we have out there? And I guess that we're going to be hearing about the lighting in on, on a different plan. We're going to find out where the trash cans are on a different plan. And when we really talked about green architect, green construction or green architecture, there really wasn't anything. Is that correct? There's Outside nothing. of inside having LED lights. Yes, there's no, nothing, uh, you know. Okay. Beyond that. Are there any questions from the planning board members? Uh, Jim Henry, Barbara, I have a couple of questions. Go for it. If, if I may. You may. Um, uh, can you tell us about something more about that roof deck? Is that going to be uh, a common area for all the uh, unit uh, dwellers? Yes, that'll be a shared roof for all the um, residents. Do you envision this uh, to be a um, owner occupied or is this going to be uh, a rental uh, facility? Uh, it's proposed as a rental. And how are you going to determine who can use the uh, roof deck at what times? Uh, that's something we can we can work with the building management and the owner on. Uh, we, we don't have anything proposed at this time. Well, you're proposing it as a common space. Uh, I'd like to know some details as to what how you're going to manage that. We can we can look at we can work on uh, uh, hours and and uh, when the roof will be available to the residents. That's definitely okay. what we discuss. My next question is: What's the slope of the roof uh, west to east? Uh, we a quarter inch per foot. And what's the overall uh, slope uh, overall uh, rise going to be? Um. It's probably about three feet in that range. I don't have the exact number, two and a half feet. I have to do the math. Well, if you had, if I had a dimension, I would gladly do the math. What's the dimension uh, east to west? Yeah, I'm trying to pull it up now. Uh, 36. I 60 feet. I'm sorry. 60 feet. 
60 feet. Yep. So you're talking 15 inches? Yes. Okay. So it's not two and a half to three feet, it's no. 15 inches. Okay. And um, you indicated that uh, where the, the uh, north and south uh, uh, walls of the building meet the adjoining buildings, you're going to put up brick veneer. Where's that brick veneer going to be? I'll show this will be a side elevation. This will be the north. Okay, so you're going to have a brick veneer on the uh, uh, doorway leading out the head, uh, uh, the doorway leading out onto the deck, right? Yep. Okay, and on the other side, you're going to have a, a wall that you're going to uh, veneer? Yes, every, whatever's above the adjacent uh, building height. And what's the... Uh, What's the south uh, elevation of that particular wall look like? The south wall, what's that going to look like? That's it here. Now, remember, the screening is not shown in this elevation, but this will there'll be screening for the mechanical units. But we would also, uh, you know, bring the brick, that same brick to the rear elevation as well. I think he has the south wall. You're, aren't you looking at the I'm looking at, I wanna, west wall? I want to know what the south side the oh, south south wall is going to yeah. There, that's it. This is it here. Isn't that the north side of the south wall? North side of the, this is the south wall, and this would be that's the south wall. This is the north wall. Yes, and this this building you're proposing uh, is basically a, uh, another floor above the. Adjoining buildings, correct? Correct. Okay. So you're going to have uh, a wall uh, extending above the adjoining building to the south. Are both sides going to be brick veneer? Yes. Okay. Is that also true on the uh, north side? Yes. Okay. Uh, I notice uh, from your one of the other elevations that uh, you had just shown, uh, there's no doorway on that uh, uh, head house for the stairwell. I assume there's going to be one. Yes, that's in this okay. elevation here. Oh, oh it's, going to, it's not going to be on the end. It's going to be on the side. Yes. All right. And... Um, the roof deck itself is going to have a railing, a wire railing. Is that what you say? Yeah, to kind of, uh, you know, control the access so people don't feel like they have the, uh, the ability just to walk anywhere they want on the roof to limit the area just to uh, define by the railing and the actual uh, elevated decking system. Okay, and on the uh, west side of the building, what's the setback of the uh, roof deck from the uh, front facade? The west side is, uh, that would be the street. It would be um, seven and a half feet, eight feet, once you thickness of the wall. Okay, and on the uh, east side? Uh, I just have to do some quick math. I don't have a dimension specifically for that. The scale, I'm sorry, the size of your drawing is so small that unless I have a magnifying glass, I can't read it. Yeah, oh, yeah. I apologize for that. Um, let me just. No, you don't have to apologize for that. <laughs> just write bigger. Is 60, it fair to say it's about 32 feet? 60 minus 20 minus 8. Yeah, 32. Okay, thank you. Is that it, Jim? Yes, that is Barbara. Thank you. Is, is there are there any planning board other planning board members that would like to chime in? Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, this is Eric. Hi. Um, so can we uh, go to your um, west facing elevation, the Main Street elevation? Sure. 
Um, so how did you decide in the, on the rhythm of the upper floor, second and third floor windows here? Mm -hmm. Um, it's based off of what we're proposing on the, the unit layout and balancing the windows with, within the space. Uh, you know, we have the stairwell here and then behind this wall, I kind of go to the floor plan actually. Okay. Probably better that way. So the way that this wall is introduced and um, just setting them, setting them up within the space, we felt uh, that, you know, this was the balance that we would create. The distance between these windows is the same and setting them up in the room. Uh, once the bed is located there and if you have an end table, uh, you won't want to push them up into the corner of that space. So, um, and then kind of reflecting that to the other side is how we came up with the rhythm for the windows. Yeah. You know, my, my concern is that um, I actually think that you could fit another window between those two. So you had one, three, and three to kind of give a less brick facing the street. Um, and I'm more concerned about the street facing facade and less concerned about the rear facing facade. Mm -hmm. Although I do also think that that's not a huge amount of glass for those spaces. But I'm curious if maybe where you have your um, paired windows in your living spaces, mm -hmm. you might be open to adding an intervening window so that you have one, three, three. Um, it's something we can look into. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I'm, and, I'm and it. not to, not to um, contradict another board member, I believe that we've recently spoken about changing the language of the zoning to complementary materials on the sidewalls rather than identical materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in this type of um, zero lot line arrangement um, in commercial architecture, the street facing facade gets the most money and then the, the, the wrapped sides, it, it is typical that it's another material, stucco or whatever, yep. particular bec particularly because the adjacent lots may redevelop at some point mm -hmm. and then they would be covering up your beautiful brick veneer. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if, if it's a question of money, I don't want to say that it shouldn't be brick wrapping all the way around, but how that money is distributed, I understand, is related okay. to your finishes. I understand your point. Um, this is Jen Souter. I actually had a, a comment that's related to what Eric was saying, because um, when you were talking about the green design um, elements that, you know, that you weren't going for certification or anything, but that there have been consideration. You had mentioned um, the HVAC, I believe, um, for efficient efficiency and LED lighting. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about daylighting and like other things that, you know, what, what would be feasible in that space. And I had the same, I had the, coming to the same answer from for a different reason for the lighting in um, for the window space is that it felt like there there was an opportunity to get more daylighting in that space, um, you know, which could go, which could solve a couple of things. Yeah. Okay. Um, Eric, well, I'm sorry, Eric and Jen, were, when you were speaking about the additional windows, uh, were we also considering that on the backside on the east facing also? I think that's a particular issue. I think the back speaks directly to Jen's issue. The back has yes. relatively little glazing relative to the total building surface, but it's more about the interior, um, the interior spaces. Now, I, I also do think that the material of the back is often quite different since it's not street facing, it's probably not terribly visible from many different directions. And so I'm open to a variation in materials front and back. Um, I still should be 
well treated and nice, mm -hmm. but um, you know, but to the service of creating better lighting on the interior in the rear. And then on the front, I think that buildings that are like this that also exist on Main Street have a higher level of glazing above the second floor than what's currently displayed. It, we have a very inconsistent style, so I can't make a blanket statement that they all do, but you know, three-story commercial buildings tend to have a higher level of, or uh, mixed-use um, buildings tend to have a higher level of glazing. Right, because if you take a look at the floor, the floor layout, those windows on the backside are in a bedroom, and the great room has pretty much, I guess it, it does have two windows. Yeah. But very separate, and each bedroom has one. It's something we could take a look at. I could talk to my client and see if there's adjustments that can be made for that. The, or they could even, this is Rick, they could even be larger openings than, than what's proposed. Correct. Right. Not necessarily increase the number, but increase the size. Width. Yes. And getting back to this is Rick again, the, the front facade in piggybacking on Eric and uh, Jennifer's comments. Um, they're definitely... It, the rhythm does not exist on the upper two floors. Uh, it, 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 my first glance, it, it gives me the impression like windows were filled in to those two dark, uh, large expanses of brick, um, like between the first on the left and then the middle two. Like it's like somebody filled in sets of windows to occupy some space. At one time, it may have been seven windows on the second and third floor. And then said they filled in a, four of them to kind of create a different interior space. And it just, it just seems like an awkward kind of rhythm on those floors. Yeah. Even within the limits of the floor plan, one might find a way of relating the upper floor windows to the window bays of the retail below to right, even, carry right. the, the expression yeah. further. Yeah, even the width of the windows on the second and third is greater than the mullions on the, the lower floor. So there's not even a relationship. You know, I mean, it seems like there could be a relationship, a stronger relationship with that kind of configuration. Right. I mean, of course, I don't want to, you're going to have to look at the floor plan and the relationship with the windows. But I think that there could be a way that the rhythm carries all three floors up. No, I, I understand that the points that you are making and it's something that I'd be happy to look at. Are, are there any, um, are, is, is, is that what you have, uh, Rick, you have anything else? I'm done, thank you. Okay. Is there a, a, any possibility that there can be some other storage for the, this area? Because when I look at the one bedroom, your only storage is your bedroom wardrobe closet. And there's, there's a closet right as you walk in the door, which looks small. I can't really tell how big it is, but where does someone put a bicycle? Where does, where do you put your, your luggage, your boxes, your, where do people put things? It's especially something that, one, especially in the one bedroom unit, cause they don't have that extra den. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there any places that you could put some storage uh, downstairs? Or I think I think there's opportunity to get some storage underneath in the parking area. Uh, I know that's going to be discussed in a little bit. We 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 have talked about that um, underneath the covered. So while it's still covered by the building, uh, but it, it is exterior. So um, I think there's something that we could work out there or look at there. Okay. Is anybody any other any other comments from board members? I mean, any other questions from the board members? Um, okay. Any other questions from our uh, our professionals, uh, Mr. Sullivan or? Um, this is Michael Sullivan. I think the uh, between the board members' comments, you've addressed most of the issues that uh, we had raised and would have raised with respect to the the building materials and the uh, particularly the west 
facing facade. The one thing I, I would add is that what, while the applicant and the applicant's architect uh, is exploring um, these comments and how to address them, uh, particularly in the in the in looking to pull up the rhythm of what's happening at street level through the structure or pres presumable structure in the in the facade along Main Street, that the the differentiation between the residential entrance and the retail portion of the building may provide an opportunity whereby you could distinguish that. And there was a comment before responding to one of our comments about the the rhythm of the building that it's only 40 feet wide and that um, there's little opportunity to do 20 to 25 feet of breaks, but um, that that retail um, entrance and the vertical circulation would suggest to me that there may be some sort of an opportunity to distinguish that portion of the building and maybe start to set up the other portion as, you know, maybe it's not exactly symmetrical, but it's more related to what's happening on the ground floor. Whether those be you know, it could be a bay or something like that. I don't know. Um, but just to add to the pot of the things that you're going to be looking at, I would suggest that that be looked at as one of the mechanisms for doing so. Um, I understand. And, and I, this is a point of commendation. Um, I, I think we don't see a lot of applicants um, with smaller apartment sizes. And we are constantly told you can't do a one bedroom apartment in 1200 square feet, which I wholly disagree with. I've lived in many of them. Um, so I like that these unit sizes are, you know, varied and small on the smaller side. Um, I think it's important that we provide that variety um, to, you know, to the marketplace in, in town. Thank you. Anything else from our professionals or board members? Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, I'd like to ask our public that if they have any questions, um, if they would raise their hand uh, and we will call upon them. Okay, it looks like we have one hand raised uh, with the uh, phone number ending in 350. Um, Nate, can you uh, unmute, please? Yes, three minutes? Yes, three minutes, please. No, no, this no. is not three minutes. Okay. All right, 350, you're um, welcome to speak. Unmute yourself, if you like. Uh, yeah, uh, Ernest Mignoli, formerly of uh, 400 Deal Lake Drive. I live on Northeast 7th Street in Boynton Beach, Florida now. I'm looking to move back to uh, Asbury. Uh, I had a question. Uh, the, uh, the lot size, or I have several questions, but the lot size. I don't know the lot size, the acreage off offhand. It, it would be on the civil plans. Acreage? Well, acreage or square footage, but that's a part of the civil testimony. So, so that will be answered at, during civil discussion. During the civil? I mean, what civil, the, the engineer, once the engineer speaks. Oh, that's part of the engineer's part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And, 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 well, no, I'm not, I'm not finished. So then no, building. What? No, that's okay. Go ahead. Oh, so building size is, uh, and building height and all that, wait to the engineer. Is you that what you're me. saying? No. That's, I said. The lot size I can't speak to, but I can give you square footages for the building. Oh, oh, okay. Well, how about the footprint of the building? How how wide is it? How deep is it? And how high is it? It's 40 feet wide, 60 feet deep on the second floor. So the deepest part, the second and third floor is 60 feet. And the roof to the top of the parapet is 34 foot six. Uh, so. Uh, Okay, and we're, and we're talking underground parking, partially underground. There's no underground parking. Okay, under building parking? Under building parking, that's correct. Okay, and, and not full, partial? Yes. Okay, how many, 
how many proposed underbuilding and not underbuilding spaces in total? Are, are you? Offered, I would defer the. Offered, I would defer the the parking questions to the civil testimony that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Okay, and, and then we're talking the, on the first floor, the retail. You said about a thousand square feet. Is that one store at a thousand, or two at five hundred, or three at three hundred square feet? We're, we're proposing one space in our plan. Okay, so it's, and it's a thousand square feet. Uh, on the ground floor level facing uh, Main Street, the sidewalk on Main Street. That's correct. Okay, so, uh, and that would probably take up most of the, the front at the sidewalk level, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, now, once you go above that level, oh, I'm sorry, behind the retail store on the ground level, there mm -hmm. is going to be some apartments too. No, there's not. Okay, so the the ground floor level is retail and parking and and utilities. And an entrance to the re residential above. And the entrance. Okay. All right. Then you go up to the second floor, which is all apartments, correct? Correct. How many apartments on the second floor? Two. Two. A, a one bedroom and a two bedroom? Correct. Okay. And the two bedroom you said was you didn't say 2,100 square feet, did you? No, I did not. The, the, the two bedroom is approximately 1,400 square feet. And the one bedroom, you said, is about 750. That's correct. And that's the second floor, two units. All right, then you go to the third floor. Same configuration? Same configuration. Okay, so now you're on the third floor, and you have four units, two two bedrooms, and two one bedrooms. And, and then what? Is it fourth level? With a roof, or is the third There's, level the rooftop? What is that? No, the third level is the, the units that you, we just, you just spoke about, and then there's access to the roof above the third level. Okay, so you got a ground floor, uh, what you call a first floor with two units, a second floor with two units, which is okay. Objection. And then a... What? He didn't say that. He said the first floor with one unit. The retail. One retail unit. Okay. Okay. Second floor, two units. Third floor, two units. And then what's above the third floor? Roof. The roof. The, the rooftop. Mm -hmm. so, right. it, so the rentable area of this building, are you saying is two two bedrooms, Two one bedrooms, a thousand square foot retail, and a rooftop for for the residents. Correct. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Uh, the the rooftop. Uh, you you're calling it a. Are there going to be any amenities up there, like any barbecues, or uh, is it going to be any uh, air conditioning units up there, or? There are mechanical units that serve the service the building on the roof. They will be screened. And okay. as far as it's just a sitting area uh, to allow residents to get some, some fresh air. Okay. Uh, are you talking about cent central air units up on the roof? Yeah, air conditioning units that service the retail and the residents. Okay. So, so the, uh, the coolers, for the, for the, the fan coolers for the air central air, you're going to have, what, four for each? One for each unit and one for the retail. Five units? Correct. Okay. All right. And the, the heat in the building is coming from where? A, a space on the first, on the ground floor, like a, like a boiler room? Are you going to have gas in there? We haven't fully got to that level of design as far as engineering the building, but we would have traditional, likely have traditional air conditioning systems for the for the residential, so they would have a furnace within their unit, um, just as similar to a single family. And then we would have a, a unit to service the, uh, the retail, uh, be a similar unit within the space. Well, okay, well, that's air conditioning. So you're gonna have the oh. five coolers up on the roof, you're gonna have, and, and then you're gonna have the units for the air conditioning in the units and in the retail store, 
But what I'm asking now about heat, are you going to have a boiler room? No, is that building no. going to have gas for heat or electric in the units? We, we have not decided whether our mechanical units for the residents will be gas or electric. That's something that we could discuss with the owner. It's a preference uh, as far as utility costs. So it's something that we have not determined. But it's so possible for them to be gas and it's possible for them to be the electric. Okay. And, and I, I would assume that either way, you have to tell the board what you're planning. If you're going to have gas, you're going to have to have Objection. a boiler room. Objection. Um, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have to tell the board that. The board has no jurisdiction as to what type of units are going to be there. The board has jurisdiction as to what's being proposed as far as the exterior units, not the interior units. Wait, the planning board has... That's correct. Has, that, he, he is correct. Next question. Who's correct, me or him? No, the, the attorney is correct. Oh, of course. Okay. Now, don't do that. I'm okay. warning you, don't do that. Okay. Does the building have an elevator? The building does not have an elevator. So it's a walk-up? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, and since there's residential, um, are you aware that the firehouse across the street, the storage place across the street, uh, some of the stores all have EPA Superfund signs on the building? And the reason I'm asking... That's, that's beyond, the, excuse me, that's beyond the scope of his testimony as an architect. Well, I, I, I don't know. Is, isn't he saying I'm planning residential units? Yes, but that, the, the, that's for the developer to be concerned with. The architect designs the building for his client. He, he, he doesn't. And, and, and to, whom can the public, to whom can the public ask if the ground, <laughs> the property there, has EPA clearance for residential units? Who would that be proposed to? I, obje I object to the question because it has nothing to do with the application. It may have to do with development and permits and things that are after the application process, but the whether there's an environmental remediation or not associated with this property uh, has nothing to do with this application. Oh, okay. I, did, I didn't know that. Are, are you the applicant? Are you the architect? Or the, is this he's the board the speaking? He's the attorney. Oh, he's the attorney. Okay. For the, for the developer. Okay. And and I guess the the board attorney would say that that's correct, right? That when the time comes for the public to ask about creating residential units above the retail, about that land uh, needing a clearance, you're saying it, it probably won't be the planning board, I can ask. It won't be the zoning. It, who will it be? The city won't issue a building permit if that ground is contaminated. I get it. So the city will make sure that that is uh, uh, suitable for residential building and occupation in terms of the EPA. Yes. The, okay, city, so, the, city, okay. the city is aware of the, the ramifications and the extent of that polluted area, the great geographic extent of that polluted area. I know what you're referring to. The gas station across the street from the firehouse and the firehouse area. I know what you're referring to. And the storage across. And I have a storage That's room in that storage, place. The Life storage. They have an EPA super yeah, fund they, sign they, on there. That issue. That that's not for us. They they cannot build on there if that site is um, uh, contaminated. I get it. Yeah. Okay. And you're saying the city will make sure. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with the public ass. The city does that automatically. Uh, if if everything is approved, part of the starting of the of the construction is that you got to get an EPA clearance from the city. No, the the city will tell them if they're in the contaminated area or not, and it goes beyond that. It, when Mr. Beekman's client does his financing, the bank that is going to invest in a property such as this with a mortgage and construction loans and the like, they do not let you build on contaminated property. But it goes beyond the scope of the board. The, it will be addressed. Let's put it that way. Oh, okay. And since you're the, the attorney for the, 
for the board, the planning board and the zoning board. Again, I'm just going to ask you, are, are you saying at some point, whatever that property is, is going to be tested and somebody's going to either approve it or not approve it? It may or may not be tested, but it will not. Nobody's just going to go in and build a building on that property if there is contamination. So, so then Mr. how could Mr. It Mr. Serpico, can we please ask um, Mr. McNally to move on because this is not a question that's appropriate yes. to the board. Yeah, let's move on. Thank Next you. question, Mr. McNally. Okay. Uh, okay, so I, I think that's about what I what I had. Uh, there's no question. Uh, relative to gas or electric for heat, uh, there's no comment on that yet. And uh, and for the board, uh, the lawyer, uh, are you are you saying when it comes to some of those other specific questions I had, wait for the engineer? Is that going to be tonight or no? Well, yes, no. we don't know. Oh, oh you don't know. It depends, it depends on how long the next witness goes, and it depends on if yeah. we hit the uh, reaching I, hour of ten o'clock. And hopefully, you don't get. Uh, public that ask as many questions as me we always we always ask the public for questions no i didn't Part say that process. Didn't say, okay all right i guess that's it okay uh okay. mr beekman your next uh witness yes i'm gonna call matthew wilder uh dan if you can just take down your uh plan there please Matt, you there? I am. Okay. Good evening, great. everyone. And I guess uh, Mr. Serpico will swear, will swear him in. Sure. Matthew, uh, I'm trying to find you here. If I talk, does it help? There it is. There I am. Okay, gotcha. Please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony about giving this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Please you state your name for the record and your capacity in which you are testifying. Sure. Matthew Wilder, W-I-L-D-E-R, and I'm testifying this evening as a professional engineer. I have testified in front of the zoning board for Asbury Park previously and elsewhere throughout Monmouth and Ocean County, probably approximately 40 boards for 120 or so applications. And your, and your license is current? Yes, it is. Okay. I would offer Mr. Wilder as a expert in the field of civil engineering, professional engineering. Okay, great. So uh, Matt, uh, you've had an opportunity to, to review the architectural plans and obviously you heard the testimony of, of Dan as well, correct? That's correct. Um, and that testimony from the extent re relative to the civil engineering, professional engineering, you would agree that his testimony uh, was accurate. Is that correct? It is. And if you can pull up your plan. Sure. And why don't we just start with an overview of your plan? Sure. Um, so I think maybe what I'll do is I'll jump to the survey first, just to give a very quick overview of what's on the property now. So we should all see the survey, which was submitted as part of our application. Um, so the property is, is L-shaped. It actually wraps around this lot one. So there's a, a 90 foot by 29 foot portion of the property that's perpendicular to First Avenue. And then there's an 89 foot by 40 foot that's perpendicular to Main Street. Uh, currently on the property is a, a detached garage. Uh, between the detached garage and First Ave is just uh, concrete. And then between the detached garage and Main Street is, is an asphalt area. Um, just for, uh, for offset purposes, the garage is uh, 5.2 feet from the eastern property line and 9.4 feet from the southern property line. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, which, which uh, drawing are we looking at? That this is the page? boundary and topographic survey that was submitted um, as part of the application. All right, which page would that be? It's, it's a one of one. It's, it's, a, separate, separate it's a separate document, correct? It's not part of the civil set. Okay. 
So yeah, I mean, realistically, that was just to give a sort of a quick overview of the existing um, property. Now, um, to answer, uh, I believe, Mr. McNally's question, the property is 5,010 square feet. Um, and like I indicated, it's L-shaped and it, it sort of wraps around the corner lot, which is lot one. So uh, what we're proposing this evening is the architecture as outlined by Mr. Condator, which includes the um, ground floor retail facing Main Street. And then we have two parking spaces, which are under the building, two parking spaces on the southern property line, and then two parallel parking spaces, uh, I'll say in the northwest of the property as you approach First Ave. Um, underneath the building, uh, you'll notice we have some sidewalks, some steps, some handicap ramps, and this area that's denoted as gravel. Uh, on the sides of the steps, there's areas where the land, the cover is not indicated. That will also be gravel. Um, we wouldn't really be able to get vegetation to grow uh, being underneath the building permanently. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly jump on to the trash because um, I know that was uh, brought up fairly early on. So currently what we're showing is a, and it might be easier on my site plan. We're showing a refuse and uh, recycling collection area, which is just west of sheet five. And I am referring, sorry, I'm referring to my uh, site plan, which is sheet two of five. And the set of plans was last revised to 33021. So we're showing this, uh, you know, refuse bin area, it's 48 square feet. So it's provided 12 square feet for each unit. But we realize that maybe it's not entirely enough. <clears throat> and we also, we're not showing a denoted area for the retail. So this gravel area will sort of be an additional area for trash bins. And also it'll house the trash bins for the retail. Uh, relative to the screening, you'll notice a thick black line that is around the trash area adjacent to lot five, which is unlabeled. We're proposing uh, a three or four foot picket style fence. I mean, realistically, it's probably gonna be a three foot picket style fence, um, just to sort of give some brief uh, screening of these enclosures. It's not a large area, so we didn't wanna do like a six foot solid fence. We thought that might be a little bit overwhelming for the area. Um, so what we're proposing is just a, a small three foot open style picket fence around that area. Um, and then um, as it relates to trash, uh, the, the intent is that the bins will be rolled out to First Avenue. Uh, First Avenue is uh, the more minor of the two roadways as compared to Main Street. Uh, additionally, Main Street has on street parking. Uh, both, both roadways have on street parking, but in the multiple times that I visited the property, the Main Street spaces seem to be occupied more regularly. Um, and then furthermore, you have a pretty large depressed curb along First Ave that sort of prohibits on street parking because it would block driveways. So the bins would be rolled out to First Avenue for collection and then rolled back into either the bin area or underneath the building within the gravel area. Um, to jump to my grading plan, which is sheet three to address uh, stormwater management. Um, so right now, the way the site drains, it drains basically where the existing garage is, is a high point. It drains to the north towards First Ave and then towards the west towards Main Street. The existing site is 95% impervious and has just about 4,750 square feet of impervious surfaces. Um, so we're matching that. We, we had our design, the goal of our design was really to match the impervious coverage to make sure we weren't increasing the impervious coverage. And then from a, uh, from a grading design, we really wanted to mimic the existing drainage patterns. So what you'll notice is we drain our drive aisle and the parking that, uh, you know, the open air parking from the south towards the north, towards First Ave. <coughs> and then what we decided to do with the building was to bring the building downspouts, as Mr. Condator indicated, down the east side wall, where they would discharge at grade into the drive aisle and then go to First Ave. If you walk down this portion of Main Street, you'll notice quite a few buildings that discharge their runoff via downspout at grade over the sidewalk of Main Street. We thought it was a better alternative to discharge them towards the east, so they go into Main Street versus uh, down, you know, in, in the uh, along the Main Street sidewalk. So all the runoff um, will drain via the gutter flow once it gets into First Ave towards the west. 
where it's captured by an inlet at the intersection of First Avenue. So there's an inlet at the intersection of First and also an inlet at the intersection of Main. And this system is connected via a manhole in the center of the road. So there's no concerns with capacity of the existing storm sewer because that's where the water goes now. And in the times that I visited the property, um, never during the rain, but oftentimes following a rain, uh, I did not notice any any drainage issues associated with the same. Matt, the yes. just just to to go along with that, the um, southeast corner uh, or near the garage, that's kind of the high point of the property, as it is. It is. That's correct. Um, so, Main Street is at a lower elevation than the rear of the property by almost five and a half feet. Okay. So, and I, I apologize, I don't recall which board member had brought it up, um, but that's the reason for the ramps and the stairs behind the retail building is we're, we're making up grade. So we have five feet or four feet to make up. So we've incorporated ramps and stairs to allow us to, to make up that grade. Um, there was a question relative to the grading for that uh, retaining wall that we're proposing on the south side of the site. We're actually gonna be able to eliminate that retaining wall. Um, with the initial submission, we were playing around with the grade and trying to um, sort of mimic what was out there. But in doing so, we need to make sure we have positive drainage. So we're going to essentially be filling uh, a couple of feet underneath the building. So that retaining wall is going to go away. So you're going to have the majority of the parking area um, at the somewhat higher elevation. And then, like I said, that, that wall goes away. So we, we designed the grading in a fashion that we want to make sure that we don't really impact any adjacent properties. So you'll notice that where we're connecting to the existing contours, it's definitely going away from adjacent lot three. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't directing any runoff to that property. So with all that being said, I, I don't believe that our proposal uh, will have a negative impact with respect to stormwater runoff. Um, We've, I've talked uh, briefly about the trash. Um, so at this point, I'll go on to the lighting. And for this, I'm going to refer to my sheet. I believe it's uh, four. Yeah, sheet four, which is lighting and landscaping. Um, and <clears throat> currently what we're proposing is two four-foot high bollard lights in the area of the uh, parallel parking. A, a valid comment was brought, brought up that would a car be parked in those areas, you have the potential that it could sort of block some of the light. So what we'll do is we're, we're gonna replace those bollard lights um, with something more appropriate considering the uh, nature of the proposed parking layout uh, amongst other changes. Uh, there were a handful of comments related to lighting, uh, including modeling some of the existing lights in the area. Uh, that existing building on lot one has some floodlights on the east side of the building as well as on the north side of the building. So we'll model those and we'll take credit for that light because uh, what we don't want to do is create something um, that's too bright. Uh, the same is true for the opposite side of First Avenue in front of, uh, I believe, 707 First Ave. Uh, there's a pole uh, street light that we will model as well to make sure we capture uh, that the, the, the light contributing from that light pole. And then the same is true for uh, some of the uh, areas on Main Street. There are some existing light poles that we'll, we'll model, uh, again, just to make sure we have proper illumination. And as uh, Mr. Condator pointed out, there are some wall sconces on the Main Street side that are somewhat decorative, but we'll provide accent lighting. We'll model those as well. Those previously were not current, were not modeled. Um, and then relative to the parking underneath the building, we were proposing one light in the ceiling. Um, as we revise all of our landscaping, we'll adjust that. Uh, one of the comments was to reduce the temperature of the lighting so that it's a more natural light color and doesn't get um, any of the those hues that, that can be um, less than ideal. So in, in that circumstance, we may end up increase, uh, introducing another light uh, because we're going to have uh, lower intensity lighting, if you will, and a, and a lower color temperature. So all, all in all, we're going to essentially redesign the lighting uh, based on the comments we received. Um, and then hopefully when we model some of the existing lighting, we can demonstrate that with even less site lighting than is currently proposed, we can adequately illuminate the site for pedestrian safety as well as vehicular safety. Um, and then as Mr. Condator indicated relative to the rooftop deck, there'll be a, a small 
um, I'm not going to say overly bright wall pack light. So we'll, we'll model that as well. Um, that's certainly not going to create any light spillage. Uh, we're talking about a somewhat dim light that's really only meant to uh, illuminate the deck area. So we may end up having a separate plan that shows just that deck illumination so that the numbers sort of don't overlap with one another. But the short answer is, you know, the goal is to provide adequate light on the site without being detrimental to the neighboring properties, but ensuring that we have safety on site and moving around the subject site. Uh, sticking with the same plan, I'll jump to the landscaping design. So we're 95% impervious existing and proposed. So the green space is somewhat limited on the site. So what we've done uh, is provided some plantings on the Eastern property line uh, to buffer this proposed development from adjacent lot three. Due to the minimal buffer, uh, it was requested that we maybe provide a fence in this area. Um, and we, we agree, we, we take no exception to that, um, providing a fence to provide an additional buffer. And there was a comment that maybe at initial time of planting, the individual plants should be uh, of a larger size. Again, we, we take no issue with that. So Matt, with, with that, what would be proposed would be a fence and the landscaping? Uh, at this time, that would be the proposal. You know, the, the, the fence provides a more continuous buffer, but from at, from the, the subject site standpoint, looking out, the, the aesthetics um, would be improved with the additional uh -huh. vegetation. Okay. Is there a reason why the, the ordinance requires a 10 foot buffer between the commercial and residential space, correct? Correct. Is there a reason why um, we cannot comply and we're asking for a variance for that? Uh, there is. Um, so it's pre predominantly it's related to access into and from the site. And the, the last thing I'll speak to tonight um, before questions is how the parking in, is intended to operate. Um, but in order to maximize the space for drive aisles and parking spaces, we've pushed a little bit closer to the east than we are permitted. That's just to provide us additional room into and out of the parking spaces. Furthermore, um, to quickly jump back to the survey, and again, this is the survey that was submitted as part of our initial uh, submission. You'll notice that the adjoiner on lot three, uh, their concrete on the side yard actually encroaches several feet into the subject property. So while it doesn't <clears throat> really impact our encroachment towards the east, it does you know, limit some of the plantings that we're able to provide. Uh, typically you'd like to do a staggered row um, of, of plants to, to enhance that buffer. But because of the drive aisles we need to provide along with the encroachment of the neighbor, we're, we're sort of stuck with the green space as we show it. You know, the, the property is somewhat unique in that uh, most of the properties which front on Main Street um, don't have the ability to even have off street parking. So while we have the ability to have off street parking, it has to come from First Avenue. So th that really sort of limits the what I'll call the operational, uh, the design operation of the vehicles into and out of the site. Um, and then just lastly on landscaping, uh, there was a comment regarding some streetscape improvements as part of the Main Street uh, roadway improvement. We have no issue with that. We'll coordinate with the city officials to get a copy of those plans. Um, if, if, if this area has already been um, designed to have certain streetscape improvements like street trees, benches, um, we'll certainly coordinate with them to depict them on our plan. Um, so we, we take no issue with that, and we agree that it would make sense. In the, um, as Dan had talked about, some of the architectural embellishments and elements, it would be um, silly to not improve the streetscape from a, from a design standpoint as well. And then uh, finally, to address parking. And well, before, this, you go that, go, sure. before you go to parking, because I think that's probably the, one of our bigger discussions here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the um, space underneath the building for parking and the layout where the where the trash and, and all that is. Sure. So uh, the chairwoman indicated some questions about storage. Uh, and we had some discussions about that. Is, is there any opportunity in light of the uh, difference in elevations? Is there some opportunity we have? to put some storage, like bicycle storage and that, those kinds of things on that first level? Yeah, and I, 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 I don't know, sorry about that. My computer's bugging out. Um, so absolutely, the gravel area actually lends itself to providing outdoor bike storage. 
I mean, it, it's covered from the elements. Um, it, it really makes a lot of sense to use at least part of that gravel area as some sort of outdoor storage, especially when you consider the fact that it is a walk up. There's no elevators. If someone has bicycle, uh, a bicycle, as more and more folks sort of get away from vehicular uh, means of transportation and more towards, you know, walking and biking, it makes sense to take this gravel area. And even if we encroach into that gravel area with some of this uh, trash or recycling bins, we'd still have enough room to provide probably a six bicycle uh, rack um, that allows the tenants to uh, safely secure their vehicles under the building. So if you could just use your mouse just sure. to show, maybe even make this a little larger, just to show the area we're talking about. Sure. Whoops. So you really have two gravel areas. You have this larger gravel area, which we really think will house, um, that's maybe a little bit too close, <laughs> which we figure will house as you closer to this parking uh, stall number five, would house the additional trash bins as needed. And then you have this additional area in the back that could be used for bicycle storage, or if it was elected to have the bicycle storage here, it doesn't make as much sense to me here as it does over here, but we have some, some areas where uh, uh, items can be stored underneath the building, um, out of the weather and out of the elements. And in that same area, uh, if you could just expound a little bit more on the, um, the ramp and how much space is needed in order to get from the elevations down to the first floor. Sure. Um, so for this, I'll sort of jump back to the grading plan. Um, so this ramp is, is designed as sort of what we call a switchback ramp, where you come down in one direction, you, you turn, and then you have to come back down in sort of the opposite direction where you initially came. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, if you're looking at the area behind the trash bins, we're at elevation 22. And because of the elevation of Main Street, our retail at elevation 18.6. So you have about three and a half feet to make up. So what we've done, what we've done here is designed a, a handicap and accessible ramp that gives you access from the rear parking area into the retail building. Uh, we've also provided steps uh, for those who are capable of using the steps um, as an easier means of, of uh, ingress and egress from the retail to the parking area and vice versa. So this area that is uh, adjacent to the steps on either side, but not the concrete the sidewalk, what, what, is, what is that area there? That's just, this is just going to be open space that we're proposing as gravel right now. Um, so, you know, obviously we're not going to get any vegetation to grow in these areas. So this is, at the current time, this is just um, additional space um, that is sort of a, a function of the handicap ramp and the stairs that we need. Um, you know, we, we can't really, with this configuration, we can't really push the parking down um, or over because of these ramps and these stairs. So these are just areas that uh, we weren't really able to utilize. So we're just proposing them to be gravel. Is there any opportunity there to have any storage? Certainly. I mean, it, I, I think it, it depends on the type of storage. If you were looking at, um, for lack of a better term, like a small Rubbermaid shed that was maybe several feet, you know, four or five feet tall, just for little odds and ends. Um, you certainly ha have the space. I mean, I can tell you what the dimensions of that would be if you give me one second. So uh, this gravel area is 11 and a half feet wide and six feet deep. So that's... just under 70 square feet. And then to the left of the stairs, uh, you have an, an eight foot wide portion that's also six feet. So just about 50 square feet. So between the two areas, you have give or take 120 square feet that I certainly think between that and this outdoor gravel area, you would be able to provide some means of, uh, of additional storage for the residents. Just a quick comment. This is uh, Jason, board engineer. Uh, those two areas that you're talking about there, <clears throat> If uh, storage was to be provided there, it looks like we might need a wall uh, or or something there. We got about four feet, right? Four or five feet of grade difference there. So we'd have to accommodate that, right? That's correct. And the question would be um, from a design standpoint, and we'd have to sort of coordinate with the owner is, 
would you want whatever storage was proposed, at least in these areas, to be at the elevation of the retail or at the elevation of the uh, parking area? So that would dictate whether the wall would go along uh, this edge of the sidewalk or if the wall would go along this edge of the sidewalk. For, for my my opinion would be it would probably make more sense to have it at the elevation of the parking area so that if someone was putting something into a vehicle or taking something out of a vehicle, um, it would, you know, so you had this area be elevated to get direct access from the parking area. Um, but that would be something that we'd sort of work out in the design at, a design, at the time of, of design. And the ramp themselves, you've looked at other options in order to bring uh, pedestrian traffic down the ramp? C correct. I mean, the, the only other option because of the grade we have to make up would be to just sort of separate the switchback elements where you would um, come down here and you would immediately go from the sidewalk towards, uh, it might be easier on the site plan so I can reference the parking space number. So you would come down the sidewalk and immediately start walking towards parking space number four and then come down and then you would come back towards the sidewalk. Um, my preference is to, to put the switchback ramp together. Um, it's first off, it's fully conforming with ADA requirements and it just, it, I sort of feel like it provides more open access area for the gravel. Um, whereas if you incorporate the ramp into this area, you'll still have the same square footage, but it will little, be a little bit more disconnected. Um, so I think the switchback ramp as we show it is a better alternative. Thanks, you answer my next question. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about parking. Sure. What, so, what, is, uh, what is the width of the area that's perpendicular First Avenue? 29 feet wide. Okay. And, and how does that restrict the parking layout? It's, it's not a lot of space. Um, so typically for a configuration um, where you have sort of two parking spaces on one side and then around the corner, you have two more spaces. You're typically looking at an area that's 40, maybe even 45 by 45 a square. Um, and then that, that would allow vehicles to back up and sort of start turning and then pull out head first. So we're a little bit squeezed in the sense that the portion of the property which abuts First Ave is only 29 feet wide. So, and <clears throat> so the, sh the short answer is, and both in the Insight and the CCH review, there were concerns about uh, vehicles backing down the drive aisle into First Ave. Our proposal is, is just that, having vehicles back down uh, the drive aisle into First Ave. Um, knowing this was a concern, I, I did a more uh, thorough review of the immediately surrounding area. And by and large, the properties in this area, which front on Main Street, don't even have off-street parking. So we're unique in the sense that we, we do. Um, but even as you go uh, down First Ave away from Main Street, oddly enough, I found quite a few of the residential dwellings don't have off-street parking um, and they all occupy on-street parking. So while we do provide off-street parking, it comes at the expense of the uh, vehicular traffic being required to back down the drive aisle. So we, we thought that due to the fact that there's already demand for off-street park or on-street parking, excuse me, especially on this side of First Ave in the same block, um, just for uh, the permanent of the record, the, where am I at? The lots that uh, don't have off-street parking are 708 First Ave, which are, is our immediately adjoiner to the east, which is lot three, 704 First Avenue and 702 First Avenue. Those uh, residential dwellings are all in the same block on the same side of First Ave. So with that in mind, there's already demand for the on-street parking, especially on this side of the road. Continuing one more street down, I noticed that 614, which is the corner, um, doesn't have any off-street parking. And that's also a duplex for what it's worth. And then the immediately adjoiner to that 612 First Ave also doesn't have off-street parking. So while I would acknowledge that from a functional standpoint, you would typically like to have 
vehicles pull out headfirst. Um, just again, considering the amount of uh, demand for on-street traffic, uh, on-street parking, excuse me, um, we thought the better alternative was would be to provide as many off-street parking spaces as possible, um, albeit, uh, as I indicated, uh, at the requirement that vehicles would have to pull uh, back down first half. And I guess the last point on that, um, these are expected to be low turnover rate parking spaces. Uh, so two of these parking spaces will address an off-street parking demand for the retail. Um, I, I, while it's possible that some of the retail um, visitors would park here, it, I would think it's mostly going to be foot traffic or people are going to occupy the off street or the on street parking along main street. Um, I, I would think it would be hard. Uh, it would not be expected that somebody would pull down first Avenue expecting to find off street parking for a retail, which fronts on main street, which isn't at the intersection. Again, this wraps around an existing building. So I don't think you're going to have a very high turnover of these spaces. Um, and then just lastly, the residential site improvement standards um, give some flexibility for off-street parking when it's an area, an urban versus a suburban area, or it's a, a, a development that's near mass transit. So while the discussion I'm having isn't directly related to parking, it is related to trips though. And parking spaces and trips, in my mind, sort of go hand in hand. So, I mean, the, the purpose of this area is a, is a downtown area. Um, and then furthermore, there, you have a nine minute walk uh, to the to the south, if I'm not mistaken, to the Asbury Park train station. So again, I, I just really don't think that you're gonna have a high turnover. Is it less than ideal that someone would back out? It is, um, but considering the low turnover nature, the, the distance you have between the property line and the curb line, the fact that you have a shoulder before the bike lane, um, I think it, I think functionally it can, it can work, it can, it can work safely. And uh, I, again, I, I view the inclusion of additional off-street parking spaces as a, as a major benefit when you consider the demand for on-street uh, currently found in the area. And Matt, you, you, we've had some discussions about what alternatives could you propose in order to have um, head-on exiting. Correct. Like, can you just explain what some of those discussions entailed? Sure. Um, so the, the main issue really boils down to the fact that our access point has to come from First Ave, and that's only 29 feet wide. So the only real mechanism by which we could get um, parking that could pull out uh, and perform a two or maybe three point turning movement to pull out head first would be if there were three parking spaces stacked underneath the building. Um, this structural I-beam would need to be moved, um, but we've had some preliminary discussions that that could be done. Um, and then furthermore, uh, the parking spaces would need to be pushed closer to the retail area. Um, that would require uh, turning these steps and, and sort of reconfiguring them. And all of that collectively, what that would allow us to do is give us more room to back a vehicle out towards the east and then uh, sort of start turning once they get beyond the limits of the adjoining vehicles and then try to pull out head first. So in, in reality, while we're, while we're proposing six off street spaces right now, in order to provide enough space to pull out head first, we would be limited to probably three off street parking spaces. So five and six would be eliminated and one of those placed in underneath the uh, building, correct? Correct. That would be located next to a, a parking space number four. And then furthermore, one and two would also have to be eliminated as um, as the car backs out and swings towards first. We're going to need most of the room uh, available to us to uh, allow the nose of the vehicle to swing to pull out head first on the first avenue. Is it possible to save either of those in order to do that? I don't believe so. Um, so so the, the, the real, the goal is to um, not require someone to do five, six point turns to leave. Uh, you make it too cumbersome or difficult uh, with people backing up, pulling forward, backing up, pulling forward. The answer is they're just gonna back out. So if our goal is to ensure vehicles pull out head first, it needs to be quick and, and easy to do. And I think the only way to do that would be to have three off-street parking spaces um, that are stacked underneath the building, 
pushed as close as we can to the retail. And then they would use this area uh, to back out and then to pull forward. And you wouldn't envision uh, vehicles on site to back into their parking spaces. Is that correct? No, again, it, it, they're going to do whatever convenient for them. Um, you know, if, if, if they backed out and if they, if they were backing out and had issues with visibility, um, you could see them planning ahead and backing in. Um, but, you know, one of the things you have sort of going for you is this entire curb line along the north adjacent to lot one is all depressed as that property has all of its parking spaces directly accessed from First Avenue. So there's no on-street parking in, in this area. Um, so from a visibility standpoint, you certainly have clear visibility when you're backing out towards the intersection. So I think, again, if you can do it safely, um, th that's really what people are gonna, are gonna do. I mean, could they back in? I, I guess they could do the same thing where they do a multi-point K-turn to get back, in, to back into their space. Um, and it certainly would be easier if there were only three spaces to, to do just that. Um, but with this configuration, I would say people are going to pull in head first and back out uh, rear end first. And just to clarify, when you said there would be some visibility, you're talking about visibility when you get to the sidewalk point? Correct. So once you get to the, to the front property line, um, you have... You have 24 feet from the property line to the curb line. And then you have the shoulder and then you have the bike lane. So in reality, when you get to this property line from a, vis from a visibility standpoint, you probably have excess of 30 feet um, where you're, you have unhampered visibility in this direction uh, towards the intersection of First Ave and Main. Now, the same can't be said for uh, towards the east because you do have vehicles with on, you have on street parking when you extend to the east. But I, I still think because of the, um, extent of the right of way and how much room is available with the shoulder and the bike lane. I do think a vehicle um, could back out safely and all the other residential driveways on first Ave. Um, that's how they're all configured. They're all configured to, to back out onto first Ave. And the, um, the intersection there is controlled by a light. It is. Okay. So, so you wouldn't necessarily, there, there's a better control than stop signs or, or, no controls. Sure. I mean, the whole purpose of a, of a stop of a signal is to make gaps and things of that nature. Um, so you certainly have a, a more um, permanent control in, with, in the form of a traffic yeah. signal. So um, the parking spaces, as you are proposing your site plan, that is to conform to what's required based upon the proposed development, correct? That's correct. Six spaces are required according to the ordinance based upon what's for, what the development is. Correct. Uh, and there's a comment, obviously, about the uh, the waiver from RSIS, and and certainly if if approved, we would have to request that as well. Is that correct? That's correct. From an engineering standpoint, what do you think is a better alternative? What you propose or what you just testified to, as far as less parking spaces? Knowing this area um, and, and the demand that can occur with off-street parking and on-street parking, um, my opinion is that a better alternative would be to provide the six off-street parking spaces on site. And back out. That's correct. Okay. But if the board wanted you to be sure that uh, cars can go head on, the alternative would be to request a variance for three or a design waiver for three parking spaces. That's correct. And, and I think, uh, you know, Mr. Leff is here this evening to talk about uh, the variance relief. But when you think about the two parking spaces that are required as part of the retail, it, we're unique in that we have the ability to provide those parking spaces. So typically if this was the neighboring lot to the south, and I think the next three or four lots to the south of us, they front only on Main Street with no ability to provide off-street parking. So where we have the ability to provide off-street parking, we're providing it. But most of the, many of the retail uses along the Main Street corridor 
don't provide off street parking. So if the board was so inclined to grant a waiver or grant a variance for off street parking, um, right away, I would say two parking spaces um, that are required could be eliminated with the understanding that you're not, you know, someone visiting a retail is not going to drive down First Ave and then drive down this driveway. Um, so two of them, I think, immediately would be would go. And then I, maybe the inclusion of the bicycle racks, um, you know, there's a, a good chance that, you know, as folks move away from vehicular traffic, they move more to walking and bicycles, um, especially when you consider our proximity to mass transit. You know, it's sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other. I see both sides of the argument, but I always prefer, maybe it's the engineer in me. I always want to provide as much off street parking as possible. Fair enough. Um, and you ha you did mention the uh, the lot coverage issues as existing and proposed. Correct. Can you just, uh, I mean, obviously we'll have some planning testimony. But can you just describe uh, what's permitted and um, in light of how the review letters were written when it comes to the, the, the division between the redevelopment area and the commercial uh, sure. business zone? Where's my, so um, I'm going to refer to sheet one of my plan set, uh, which is the exhibit entitled tax map. So um, the, the main street redevelopment zone is on the west side of the property. And you can see this dash line, which represents the B2 zone. So uh, flipping that to our plan, um, you know, th this is the portion of the property under the redevelopment regulations. And then this would be the portion of the property in the B2 zone. To, to look at the property as a whole, um, there is no coverage requirement in the B2 zone. So theoretically, you could have 100% coverage. In the redevelopment zone, there's a requirement of 90%. So if you took a port, if you basically averaged it out and took a look at the portion of the property which fronts on Main Street at 90%, the portion of the property which fronts on First Ave at 100%, you work out to an overall site percentage of 95.2% being permitted, and we're proposing 95%. Now, we do need the variance because we are exceeding the coverage in uh, along Main Street, but you know, the property is unique in that it's bisected mm -hmm. by a zone boundary. So I think it, it's, I'm not going to say short-sighted to look at the property <laughs> as this zone and that, <laughs> and that zone, but I think for, for context, it's important to look at the property as a whole. And that's a similar issue when it comes to the rear yard setback as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, our rear yard setback is to an imaginary zone boundary. So we have we have a rear yard setback within the redevelopment area of zero feet. Uh, I believe that's correct. Let me just pull up the the letter. Just bear with me one second. That's correct. But to be clear, what we're talking about is the shaded area in what's on the screen now. That's correct. C so, correct. So, so there is approximately 29 feet from that, uh, the back of that shaded area to actually the uh, furthest east uh, side of the property. That's correct. Right. Um, and you already testified at lot coverage. One other question regarding parking. Sorry to go back at that, but um, there also was a comment about parking in the in a front yard. Um, can you just ex describe why we're asking for relief related to that parking? Sure. Um, so the parking that's in the front yard is uh, this what I'll call parking space number one. And again, it, it's sort of boils back to what I had said earlier about attempting to uh, first meet, meet the ordinance requirements, but also to just maximize the off street parking. Um, so we're proposing, and, and this area is already uh, concrete, um, already improved. Uh, I'm not sure as to the existing garage, what that prior use was, um, but it's an area that was likely used for parking previously. So again, just to, to maximize the off-street parking to reduce some of the demand for on-street, we've included this uh, additional parking space, which is partially located in the front yard setback. And um, is parking space two part of that front yard? 
as well? No, so the, the required front yard is a 10 foot front yard okay. setback. So the dash line is here. So okay. while the building is, the parking is in front of the uh, building, uh, the actual setback line is in, in this area. So um, parking space two would, would be not be technically in the front yard. Okay. And parking space two, is that uh, ADA space? So right now the, the plan does not show an ADA space, um, but there are, are two areas where we can provide ADA accessibility. One would be to uh, convert space two to an ADA space, um, but that would reduce our drive aisle with an additional two feet from 14 down to 12. So my, my preference would be to not do that. The other option is um, to again, move this structural I-beam and take the uh, parking area adjacent to lot four, um, th this area here, and actually cut in a, a loading zone for a handicap uh, area. That can be relatively easily accommodated. Um, so my intent would be, uh, unless the board so chose to um, waive the requirement for parking for the retail element, um, if we were uh, to provide parking for the retail element, I would take parking space number four and add a handicap loading zone adjacent to it. And obviously we would need to adjust some grading, spot shots, things of that nature, um, but th that would be the intent. And would that interfere with space five? No, so, it's, so the way it would work is um, the loading zone wouldn't need to be accessible from a drive aisle. So the loading zone can actually be offset behind the curb line, behind the sidewalk. It's just to allow someone who's handicapped to, to load and unload, whether it's just getting out of their vehicle or if they have some sort of wheelchair lift. Um, we could, so we could offset the, air, the, the parking space into this area. Again, we'd have to rework some sidewalks and play around with things. Um, but the, the area to the south of parking space number four would be designated as the handicap loading area. Okay. And um, you have some walkways coming from spaces one and two towards the building? We do, we do. Um, and for some reason it's, it's unhatched, but um, we, we have this area here, with, which is a, uh, a typical ramp. Um, and then, you know, again, a, a sidewalk area. So there's some depressed curb that would need to be uh, better depicted on the plan. Um, but the intent is uh, to, to provide a safe, accessible path from all the parking spaces uh, towards the building, whether they're visiting the retail or going to the residential units. Okay. And we have one retail space. Is there anything um, uh, regarding a dedicated loading space here? What's the There's not. Um, and, and in reality, uh, we're sort of trying to please two masters. Um, there's just really no way to provide um, a dedicated loading zone. And um, I hadn't in my site visits seen any of the adjacent commercial tenants on Main Street load and unload, but I suspect that a vehicle parks in an on-site, on-street parking space in front of that individual tenant or space and brings the materials in through the front. So we would be, we would have the ability to do something similar or they can actually park on First Ave beyond the limits of the property rather than queue on Main Street and then bring the, uh, whatever the delivery products were into in through the back. But my hunch is it would probably occur from Main Street. Okay. You're not aware of any easements on the property, correct? No, my firm conducted a survey. Um, we had the benefit of a title report. And uh, within that uh, survey and title report, no easements or encumbrances were identified. And we're not proposing any easements? That's correct. Um, there was some um, encroachments that were identified. We would have those encroachments, including the antenna, be removed in order to construct the building? Uh, is this on, along the... There's, yeah, along the south side of the adjoining building that's to the north. Oh, co correct, correct. So certain encroachments onto the property will have to be removed. We, we've tried to, at least from the eastern property line, where the neighboring residential encroaches onto our property, we've tried to design our uh, uh, site to not have to impact their improvements, even though they do encroach onto the subject property. And then I guess just one quick uh, step back with traffic circulation. Um, there was a question regarding emergency vehicles and how um, they would it, uh, uh, service the site. Um, and they're going to service it in a similar fashion to how I'm proposing the vehicles accessing the site. Um, if, if 
the a fire truck or an ambulance was serving the retail, there's a good chance they would be parked in Main Street. But if for whatever reason they needed access to the rear, um, they would do what the vehicles do. They would pull in and then they would back out. Um, they have the benefit where they have lights. So um, they would be able to essentially stop traffic to perform their movements um, by turning on their, their emergency hazards. And if there were uh, cars parked in spaces one and two, there's sufficient width? There is. So there's 14 feet between uh, the drive aisle itself is 14 feet. Uh, that would be sufficient for a, a fire truck or an ambulance. And that's, again, assuming worst case scenario where they actually had to come onto the subject property. Okay. And uh, the refuse area, you think there's sufficient space to comply with four weeks of recycling? Uh, I do. So the requirement for uh, in the code for uh, residential storage is 12 square feet per unit, which is 48 square feet, which we have. But as I indicated, we also have this gravel area, which would easily double the amount of storage, if not slightly more, even when we have the inclusion of a bike rack. So I think from a, a storage standpoint, we certainly have adequate uh, provisions for trash and recyclable material. Okay. And what about utility services, gas and electric and, and those things? Sure. Um, so the, the um, whoops, holy moly. So um, if you look at my plan, you'll see these sort of dashed lines that say W and G. Um, so when we had done our survey, we were lucky enough that someone was digging somewhere around our site. So they had called for a utility markout. So W obviously indicates water. G obviously indicates gas. Um, so the intent would be, and um, as Dan uh, Conditor indicated, um, there hasn't been a determination relative to gas versus electric. My hunch is it would probably be gas. So we have the underground utilities in the area. Um, we have issued uh, will serve letters or capacity letters to both sewer and water to ensure they have adequate capacity. Um, those were submitted uh, maybe three to four weeks ago. We haven't gotten a response yet, um, but considering the what I'll call the minor nature of the development with respect to the, the larger picture of all the development, I would think there's adequate capacity for, our, uh, for, for this development. But again, we will confirm that um, there's both adequate capacity for sewer and water. Okay. Um, and going through the Insight Engineering uh, letter, there's some comments of some design or some waivers that we're requesting um, that we would comply with for any final approvals as, as a condition of approval. For example, paving widths within 200 feet. Correct, yes. Uh, location and extent of all utilities within 200 feet, we would, you would show that? We would. Um, um, excuse, me, well, excuse me, can we just go over which specific items are we talking about? That sure, sure. On, so I'm starting, yeah, so I'm starting on number, we started on number three on page two. Okay. And all right, so I'll, I'll identify each number. Uh, so number four is utilities within 200 feet. Uh, number five, you address that there aren't, you're not aware of any existing or proposed easements. That's correct. Um, Seven, we talked about the rooftop equipment uh, in the architectural testimony. That's correct. Do you expect there to be any need for a phasing plan, which is identified in number nine on page three? I, I don't. A uh, particle of this size uh, should really be constructed in a single phase. Um, how about number eight? The color rendering? Yes. We talked about that with the architect and we couldn't submit it. Okay, so next time when you come back, yes. we you will, you'll yes. bring that. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, we, uh, we provided testimony through Dan regarding the screening in number 11. Did I skip Dan? Correct. And we had also on for number 12 had discussed, uh, the reason for the variant relief as it relates to the buffer strip. Right. And, and 10 seems to be kind of an overview of one through nine, as I read it. Correct. And I think um, Mr. Conditor's testimony probably provides a, you know, an adequate summary of what we're looking to do from within the building. And, and hopefully my uh, testimony had provided a, a detailed summary outside of the building. Right. And you testified regarding number 13, regarding the means of and methods of disposing of solid waste? That's correct. Um, and, and again, the, the what's envisioned there is 
the individual cans will be brought out to the curb along first. That's correct. Through, through the management company? Yes. Okay. Um, signage was addressed during uh, Dan's testimony regarding the front signage. Jeff, can I, can I ask you to pause for one second? Um, I know this is something that comes up all the time. Uh, back to um, <clears throat> number 11, we talked about what's on the roof. Uh, another question that comes up often would be uh, meters. <laughs> you need a hot box for uh, gas and electric. So, so we, we haven't had that conversation with the gas and electric company yet relative to um, the design, but considering <laughs> the nature of the building, um, my hunch is that you'd have uh, the, util the the meters mounted probably on the back side of the retail building uh, underneath the covered area. Um, I, I don't see any reason why the meters would be really mounted anywhere else and be visible. Um, so the, the, the covered, uh, the portion of the second floor, which covers the ground floor parking should do a pretty good job of hiding the meters uh, as may be necessary. Thank you. They're also, Matt, is that area that we talked about behind, um, or I should say probably in front of the parking spaces that, Correct. that could be utilized where you're using the ramp to get down to that lower level? C Correct. All right. And we're uh, only talking about five meters. Correct. And, and uh, we, we've had enough uh, coordination with uh, um, the util the gas and electric company that I, I would, if, if I hazard a guess, I'm going to be wrong as to what they want. Um, but the, the short answer is they're not going to be visible from any of the streets and um, we'll make sure we coordinate with them to, to ensure that it meets their standards. Okay. Um, and Dan had provided the uh, testimony regarding the architectural elements in number 15. Correct. Um, number 16, uh, loading and unloading. You just testified that you're envisioning um, most of that being done probably along Main Street. Uh, c correct. Consistent with really what occurs elsewhere uh, for other commercial tenants. Okay. Um, number 17, you provided um, <clears throat> some comments regarding lighting and certainly you'll work with the engineer to ensure that the lighting is appropriate. We will. Okay. Um, number 18, uh, it's your belief that there are sufficient utilities to provide what's uh, needed. For Correct. And as I indicated, we provided will serve letters. As soon as we get responses with a subsequent submission, we'll provide the, the responses to those will serve letters. So another, another part of that comment was um, you're going to have to bring utilities in from somewhere. So we'd like to see on the plan where that's going to be and then have the trenching details and pavement repair. And, stuff. and certainly uh, make, absolutely agree. And furthermore, if, if, Turns out the utilities need to be brought from Main Street. Um, as is indicated elsewhere in your letter, we would require ND, NJDOT approval for that work. So we absolutely acknowledge that. And um, as soon as we get a little bit further with the utility companies and we get their mapping, um, we'll be able to more uh, provide a greater level of detail for those connections. Thank you. Great. Um, are you aware of there being any negative uh, impacts regarding noise, air, water quality or for this development? There's not. And I think, um, you know, again, uh, Mr. Leff is here who can really speak to that. But the the portion of the property to be occupied by building is along Main Street where it's supposed to be occupied by a building. The areas where we're not occupying a building are, are open air areas. So I don't I, I don't envision that this development will have any uh, impact with respect to noise, air or water quality. Um. And you'll put on your plans uh, areas of pavement repair that are going to be required? Correct. Once we have confirmation as to the location of the utilities, uh, we'll note those areas on our plan. And that also, though, is, is uh, related to the driveway as well, correct? C correct. There were some comments that uh, questioning the condition of some of the existing um, curb and sidewalk along First Ave. Some of it is in um, poor shape. So we will show that that curb and, and those driveway aprons um, are to be replaced. Um, the, the portion of sidewalk in, along Main Street is actually in pretty good condition. So um, the only uh, sidewalk along Main Street that I would envision being replaced is if something's damaged during construction. Um, but along First Ave, there is some uh, replacement that needs to occur. Okay. 
Um, and you had you provided some discussion about storage. We'll have to explore that a little bit more between now and the next meeting. Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, you did testify about four weeks of, of recyclable material, number 24. Correct. Um, we did have some discussion, obviously, about the parking spaces required. Uh, we are in compliance with the ordinance, correct? That's correct. Uh, however, we would have to get a waiver related to RSIS. Correct. Okay. Uh, number 26, um, turnaround, in your opinion, other than a smaller number of parking spaces, is there, is there any opportunity to have a reasonable turnaround on this site? I, I do not believe so. I, I think in order to do that, you're asking somebody to do um, too, too many point, too many pulling forward, backing up, pulling forward, backing up. So um, I, I think this is for, for this number of parking spaces, this is the optimal configuration. And I think your testimony was you need about a 40 by 40 foot area in order to do give, that. Give or take it, it, it. Yeah. Give or take it really, it sort of depends on the, on, on the design vehicle, but that's a good rule of thumb and where three quarters of that or, or two thirds of that uh, with the, the depth of, or the width, have you want to look at it along first half. Okay. Um, comment number 28 deals with a separation between the proposed driveway and the existing driveways. I don't know if we necessarily talked about that, but you did mention about um, hashing along that sidewalk. Yep. And um, uh, again, I'm referring to sheet two of my set. And you'll notice a, a 13 foot dimension uh, in the in the north uh, east corner. So that's denoting um, the limit, the, the location of our driveway to the neighboring driveway. So we're pro providing 13. And off the top of my head, I, I don't recall what the ordinance requires. Okay. And what about the corner building? Yeah. I, so the, the the answer is pretty much zero in, in that this whole area is sort of depressed. Um, I guess theoretically, if you were to extend this curb line to the street, you'd have a three foot buffer in between. Um, but I sort of look at this as it's all one large driveway just because of how the corner lot currently uh, utilizes the area. Okay. Um, we talked about uh, how the property would be maintained, number 29, and what you envision is a, a management company maintaining. Correct. Um, number 30, uh, are we going to have any striping in the public right of way now? There's none proposed at this time. Okay, so the plans were changed to address that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, you did talk about the uh, ADA ramp. If an ADA space is required, there are a couple of options that you, talk, you discussed. That's correct. Um, and storm warning management. Uh, the way that's being proposed is that manage, management would be uh, on site to the um, the curb gutter along First Avenue and then ultimately to the west to that inlet drain. That's correct. Okay. You don't envision uh, much of um, the drainage to come onto the Main Street side, Main Street sidewalk, correct? C correct. I mean, you, you might have portions that hit the parapet or the face of the building and trickle down but we're, we're attempting to send as much uh, runoff into the street in First Ave where it flows via gutter flow into that existing storm sewer system. And that's compatible with the existing conditions? It is, especially when you consider that uh, the two inlets that are at the intersection of First Ave and Main Street uh, here, I'm circling now and here that I'm circling now, um, they actually connect via this manhole in the intersection. Um, so it, it's really all combined into one system. Um, so whether we send runoff to this inlet that goes to this manhole or this inlet that goes to this manhole, um, the system, as I've seen from multiple site visits, seems to have adequate capacity. And you're envisioning that that drainage will run directly to, toward First Avenue and not onto either lot three or lot one. That's correct. Um, when you look at the uh, existing contours, which we're, again, mimicking, you'll notice that they are angled. I don't remember if it's a back. I think it's a backslash. They're sort of angled like a backslash to push water away from lot three and towards First Avenue. Okay. Um, in the event there's any NJDOT approvals, that would be any that would be a condition of any approval anyway. Certainly. Uh, number thirty-four. 
uh, the existing curb along First Avenue. Um, is there any curbing that we would have to modify at this time? Not, not really modify, but there's some that's in somewhat poor condition um, that probably would need to be replaced when you consider the construction. And, and some of the slabs uh, in this area, the concrete slabs have settled and cracked. So th those would be replaced as part of this application. And whatever the city would require in connection with construction, that would be agreed to. Correct. Okay. And, and I'm, I think that's something worthy of adding to the plans uh, to make sure that the sidewalk slash apron is uh, appropriate for vehicular loading. Absolutely. So, so we'll, we'll update the plan to include details of the new concrete and the new driveway aprons um, that, are, that are suitable for, for the use. And you testified that the proposed wall on the property line, that's actually the wall that's being removed. Reference that, that, the, that was previous. Yeah, uh, that was, sorry to cut you off. That was previously proposed with uh, the grading design, um, but that wall is not going to be necessary anymore. So we'll remove that from our plan and we'll provide additional spot elevations to demonstrate that that wall is not needed and we don't have any uh, back pitched areas or drainage problems. Okay. Um, and you'll comply with the city engineer, engineer to deal with uh, sewer connection fees, correct? That, that's correct. Do, do you know at this point if the sanitary sewer is within First Avenue? So when visiting the property, um, I didn't notice any manholes within the immediate vicinity of the property. So I'm not certain. Um, it, it is possible that there are, um, there are manholes, several manholes in this intersection. Um, it's hard to discern um, during normal hours when vehicles are traveling on and on, you know, in and around the area, what those manholes are, speci are specifically for. But in part of the will serve requests that we made for water and sewer, we also asked for utility mapping. Once we have that, we should be able to put together a comprehensive design for the uh, utilities for the project. Okay. If you uh, contact our office, we have some information. We don't necessarily have everything, but we have a lot. Uh, that would be helpful because uh, we haven't been that successful in the last uh, month or so. So I, I will certainly reach out for that. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and you're you in number thirty eight. You did testify about what you envision for emergency vehicle access to the site. That, that's correct. I do not have any other questions for Mr. Wilder. Uh, what about number thirty nine? Looking at the wrong one. I don't have a 39. I have a 38. Uh, 39 is at the bottom of page eight. It talks about the HVAC equipment. Um, I think uh, th there's some sort of disconnect between my, my plans and Mr. Condator's plans. As Mr. Condator indicated that the HVAC units will be located on the roof and will be screened. Um, I think when you look at my plan, I show a small HVAC area. We'll do a better job denoting uh, where the HVAC area is for um, consistency with Mr. Condator's plans. Thank you. And then um, the outside agency approvals, uh, we obviously agree to obtain all necessary outside agency approvals, which may include NJDOT. Uh, just a, a couple other things, if I may. Um, when I know you're going to be working on the lighting plan, um, make sure, please, when you do that, that we know what the maximum spillage is to the neighboring properties, just so we can evaluate that. Sure. Um, so, so typically what we do is anywhere where it's zero, um, we sort of mask it so it doesn't get included in our average. But um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll model the adjacent buildings and, and extend the uh, illumination levels and analysis beyond the property limits. So it's a really full picture. And that also will include the existing lights found in the area. Um, we're going to overhaul, uh, overhaul the lighting and, and we'll be ensured to include that. Did you say, I think you addressed this before, did you say refuse is going to be private hauling? No. So the, the intent is um, both the retail and the residential um, will bring their trash bins uh, from either this, this uh, fence and storage area or this gravel area, bring the bins to First Ave where they'll be picked up by the city. All right, um, under the building by, well, 
the the uh, the open part by parking spaces three and four, and then the walkways and switchbacks and ramps and all that kind of stuff. Um, it is covered. It won't get rained on, but it is exposed as well. It may get some driving rain, snow melt, that kind of thing. Uh, and that area appears to drain toward the building. I don't expect it'll be a ton. Uh, the paved area where the parking is uh, appears to be dra draining out toward First Avenue. Uh, but there are parts that drain toward the building. Um, maybe uh, when you take a look at the plans and come back in, you can come up with something to capture that water and protect the building. Absolutely. Uh, we're talking, it, it wouldn't require more than a couple of tenths of pitch. So uh, no issue, no issue providing that. Okay. Um, I, you know, this is something that I, I'm sure is going to come up more as, as, uh, the board members start asking questions and, and whatnot. But um, if the board finds or, or agrees with you that uh, providing the parking is better than not providing the parking, uh, despite the potential conflict of backing out, uh, there there is a, you know, the, the concern of backing out obviously goes to being able to see the cars in First Avenue, uh, but also being able to see the pedestrians. So just thinking it through, um, I think we should give some thought if that's the way it's going to be to some sort of warning system, which may be as simple as a sign to the pedestrians saying, you know, something like caution vehicles backing out onto street. So just, just something to think about. Agreed. Um, there's a lot of elements where an engineer can take uh, some liberties. Um, safety is not one of them. So uh, I think we all have the same goal at the end of the day is to, to make sure the site functions safely. So absolutely. Okay, and those were, um, thank you for going through my letter point by point. You uh, addressed all the highlighted portions I had and those extra questions, so I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Jason, you're, uh, you're okay? They've addressed all my questions. And your con concerns? Yep. And, and, um, I know that there are, uh, and what I would recommend, is, as I always do for our, our applicants, is to uh, listen back on the uh, on in situations like this that there are a lot of modifications that we're asking for to be put on the plans. So we're expecting a lot of, a lot of changes that are going to come to us, um, and you know I'm assuming that you guys are keeping track. Or, or, listen, or listen to it on APTV, because uh, I just want to make sure that we have everything the next time you guys come here. Um, I, can, I, certainly, I certainly have a very long list of things that we're asking for. So, uh, If I could piggyback onto that, when you guys revise your plans and resubmit, if you'd be so kind as to give us a point by point to tell us where the changes are, that would be very helpful. Of course. And we'll coordinate with Mr. Condator's office to provide one comprehensive uh, re resubmission letter. Thank you. Okay. Um, the, uh, do the uh, board members have any questions or concerns? Jim Henry, Barbara, I have a couple of comments or questions go ahead. Uh, for Mr. Wilder, if I All may. Right. Questions, go for it. Okay. Uh, concerning the stormwater, uh, did you consider a direct direct connection to the uh, storm sewers in First Avenue? Uh? Yeah, we had not, um, and mainly being as we didn't want to end up ripping up so much concrete and, and asphalt. If if the question is, can we provide a direct connection? We can, um, and we would prepare the asphalt well, accordingly. I know that was a comment in uh, Mr. Fincher's uh, Fincher's letter. Um, if, if the board so chose that that is a desirable feature, uh, we can certainly provide that. You indicated that uh, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, cracked concrete and settled concrete in that driveway. And uh, maybe you have to rip that up anyway. So you could pick up the uh, stormwater in a, uh, uh, at a, a stormwater grate and uh, just continue it on to the uh, storm sewer possibly. Since you're going to have that uh, torn up anyhow, so some yeah. of the sure, we'll take a look okay. at that as we're revising the the plans uh, accordingly. 
Uh, next question I have is concerning the uh, the stairway uh, from the parking area down to the uh, retail uh, and uh, uh, the residential areas. Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to provide any uh, handrails along the stairs and or along the walkway? Uh, along the stairs, handrails will be required based on the elevation change. Um, the walkways, it will sort of be dependent upon what we end up deciding to do with respect to storage and if we incorporate some retaining walls. Anywhere where um, we exceed 30 inches in, in grade differential, we have to have railings. Um, but typically anything, my preference is six inches of, of grade differential, you propose some sort of um, fall protection. So uh, with the revised submission, we'll include uh, showing those handrails and railings for safety. If you uh if in your redesign, you decide to use the uh, areas uh, north and south of the, the stairway for storage, would you consider moving the uh, stairway to the north to give you a, a bigger contiguous area for storage? Would that Correct. be a feasible? No, that would be, uh, that's a great suggestion. Um, and the, the storage element just came up today prior to us revising the plan. So absolutely correct. We would shift it, the stairwell to one side or the other to make the storage area as large as possible in one contiguous area. Okay. Uh, are these parking spaces uh, one through six going to be designated uh, uh, for a particular party's use? I mean, we certainly can. Um, so as it's required, you know, you have one space required for each unit. Um, my hunch is that space is three, four, five, and six in that circumstance would be designated unless we needed to provide a handicap accessible space for the retail, then space four would be designated for that. Um, but I, I don't think there's any issue with assigning parking spaces. And for such a small parking area, it probably makes a lot of sense, but um, it, it would really be through the, the management company for the site. And just one other uh, question concerning the uh, those parking spaces. Um, do you, in your considered opinion, uh, do you think that the uh, parking spaces that are uh, going to be in this area, uh, one through six, do you think they're really going to be used by uh, people uh, going into the retail uh, store? I, I it, don't. Seems, it seems to me that if there is parking behind the building, uh, the, the general assumption is going to be that the uh, parking behind the building is for the residential uh, ha inhabitants rather than the retail. Uh, I, I would agree. With you. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, the short answer is we're proposing six spaces because we're required by code to have six spaces. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would agree in this circumstance, two of the parking spaces being eliminated probably makes a lot of sense. It allows us to increase the green space. Um, even with four spaces, it doesn't give us the room to really reconfigure the parking where you can pull out head first. Um, but I think any introduction of green spaces is nice and warranted. Um, but to your point, I, I don't think someone would travel along Main, turn down first, go behind the building in hopes of finding, uh, again, it, it's not even the corner lot, so it's going around an existing building. So my hunch is probably not that those spaces would be used for the retail. Uh, just to address your comment concerning uh, people backing out, I would suspect that if somebody comes in early, uh, if the uh, spaces uh, five and six are not utilized, it's very easy for them to pull into those spaces and back into three and four uh, with no difficulty. And then at that point, when they leave, they can pull out or vice versa. Uh, they can pull into uh, three and four back into five and six and uh, pull out four. So you have, I think you're going to have a, a pretty decent mix of um uh, people backing, uh, pulling out head first rather than backing out. Um, but I think that's something that, that's going to happen naturally. You don't have to, uh, you can't really plan for it. it. It would also be difficult to try to enforce that. Um, but to your, to your point, I mean, I think most people, if the spaces were open, 
and they had the ability to utilize this area to back in so they could pull out head first, I, I think they would, but it, it would be a function of the other cars that are parked in the area and what sort of sure. is going on. It'd be something that would happen as you got into the driveway. C correct. You would notice that, hey, I can back into the spot. That's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else from the planning board have any other questions? No? Uh, okay, I have a couple. Um, uh, on the next time you come back, if you could just show where the retail trash gravel area, where they're, I just need more specifics as to where you're proposing the storage versus the trash. And I know that you're coming back with more detail on a number of these. So if you can make sure we have that. Um, I'd like to also see, uh, it's hard for me to tell on here what the dimensions of each of those uh, parking stalls are, because it's, it's a little tough to tell. Yeah. Uh, so if you could just uh, elaborate on that. Sure. Okay. I, I can give them to you now if you're interested or. Uh, no, that's okay. If okay. You could just I'd like them on there so everyone can see them. Sure. Um, and I'll make it more, more uh, readily uh, visible. Yeah, that would be great. Um, okay. The, I'd also like to, and, and this would be for Jason, um, if you would know, or if we have to find out, is there truly an ADA requirement here with four units? It, it, the, the retail is what triggers the ADA spot, not the residential units. So that's why we were talking, maybe it would be more appropriate to request a variance and eliminate two of the parking spaces because in reality, the, the retail is not gonna have folks park in the rear of the building. If we eliminated the parking for the retail and the parking proposed was only for the residential units, um, this type of development would not be required to have an ADA space, I believe. So one thing I would suggest uh, the board consider as you consider what, what uh, Matt was just talking about is um, perhaps those parking spaces for the retail could be employee parking, freeing up spaces on street and whatnot. Just something to think about. And just I might to, add to that, if okay. I may, as Jeff Beekman. Um, it might make sense when you're talking, Matt, to explore spaces five and six, perhaps being that employee parking so that cars are more comfortable with Mr. Henry's comment about backing in if they're sure. designated for that. That's a good point. So um, after hours, those spaces would theoretically be open and they would be allowed, you know, they would allow tenants to uh, back out and uh, use those areas for circulation. And then just, just for a point uh, to the board's edification, there is actually a handicapped parking space on Main Street uh, in front of the, um, uh, the existing corner lot. It doesn't entirely meet existing code um, in that the, the loading zone is sort of incorporated into the parking space, um, but it is striped for handicap accessibility just for, for what it's worth. Okay. Um I know that there was a mention of no front yard parking. Is Does that require a waiver or a variance? I believe it requires... A this is Michael Michael Sullivan. That's a, that's a variance. Um, and just to be clear about that, it's not parking within the, the required front yard setback. It's within the front yard. So it's both spaces one and oh, two. I stand corrected. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So then we have to... If we keep these two, then we have to add that to the variances. That's correct. So this isn't considered a through lot? I'm not sure. It, it's a very unique property. I, I don't... Yeah, yeah it's not... It, so it's not really a through lot, but it's also not really a corner lot. Um, in, in planners' terms, I don't, I don't know what you would call, <laughs> what you would call this type of configuration. Um, are you okay, Eric? Mm -hmm. Um. Also, I'd like to see um, where 
it's it's hard to tell here when you're saying that you're going to be bringing the refuse to the street. Uh, will that? I I just want to make sure that that does not end up in front of lot three's front door. So how do, how do we make sure that all of that is not in the way of cars coming in on the driveway? Right. And that it's not in the neighbor's front yard. Sure. Um, so so the, the, the parking or the, excuse me, the parking, the, the trash bins would really be on the sort of, if you extend the Western property line to first Ave, um, it, it would really be sort of in this area. So I would expect the bins to be lined up here. Um, and the reason for that would be to make sure that we maintain this access aisle. What I wouldn't want to do is put the bins here, have someone, I know it's a little bit tough to explain, but have someone try to pull in around the bins and then go around the parallel parking spaces. So in reality, I would expect them to be sort of stacked in front of the parallel parking spaces and this three foot strip. And you'd have about 10 and a half feet linearly to provide for the trash bins. Um, so, you know, you, I, I think you'd have adequate room to provide the, those bins at the street without um, impacting the corner lot or adjacent lot three. Okay. But I, I, we can graphically show that on yeah, the plan of right. how it would look. Mm, sure. Right, because, because there still are five parking spaces that are on, on lot one just to keep away from them also because you don't want uh, absolutely. them to be getting them. Yep. yep. Okay. What we can do is we can show where they would be a, a temporarily stored waiting pickup. Okay. Um, and one thing that I just want to mention to uh, that we would like to understand, and you don't have to answer it now, and I and I get it. In every picture that I see of those of that area, um, I see I see a trash bin sitting in the middle of the driveway. So I'd like to understand, and you don't have to answer now. Where is that trash bin going and whose is it? Understood. Okay. So you can bring that back to us. Um, is there anything else that any of the planning board members have? No? Okay. Let's open it up to the public. Wait, oh, if I may. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I suggest that since this witness is going to come back and give extensive testimony on the changes that the cross-examination should be at that time because uh, no sense in talking about any cross-examining question, the witness about things that are going to change uh, until they change and then, and then certainly ask those questions. Well, actually, actually I, I agree with you, Jack, because there are going to be significant changes to here right. um, based on everything that we've talked about by the architect and the engineer. Right, because you're going to wind up asking questions about things that are invariably going to be changed. And then when he comes back, you're going to ask the questions about them again. So there's no sense in doing repetitive uh, questioning. Uh, the other thing is, I think the board uh, should uh, seriously consider some recommendations on the, on the parking issue so that the next time the applicant comes back, if you want less spaces, uh, if you're inclined to go with that, that design, based on safety and so on, we should tell the applicant to come back with something of that nature versus coming back with it the way that it is now. Uh, this way we get all your changes, hopefully in one fell swoop um, and it'll be more efficient. Does anyone want, anybody want to take a shot at what they think the parking situation should be? Anyone in the planning board? Well, Barbara, if you, Jim and Henry again, I would suggest that you keep the six spaces. Uh, I think the uh, idea that uh, two of them be marked for employees is a good idea. And I, uh, I, I think in the long run, keeping the six spaces is a good idea. Anybody else? If I, if I may, this is Jeff Beekman. Yeah. If I could just comment on that, just to make sure we understand. So if we're gonna have des designated employee spaces, that would only be during business hours. Okay. That, I think that's certainly reasonable. I, you know, if the, if the people who are designated to use these spaces aren't there, there's no sense in restricting somebody else from parking. Yeah, I just, you know, in case there's a guest or whatever, I just wanna make sure we're okay with that. Well, 
And I think it's almost impossible to enforce. I mean, be realistic yeah. about it. Thank you. Right. I, I'm, I'm also, I, I tend to agree with Mr. Henry on that. Um, because, I mean, when you're realistically looking at this, we have five spaces right next door. And guess what they do? They back out. I don't like it. I, I think it is a safety hazard. But I think that there's six spaces, and I, and I, and I hesitate to think that, that one of them would have to be ADA. And, it, and I, I don't know. That, I struggle with that. For, for a retail space, that this, this is just such a different type of lot that we haven't had to deal with where you have two different songs that, you're de- that you have to, two different masters that you really have to take, uh, deal with here. Um, I tend to think to, to keep the six. I don't know if anybody else on the board has any other um, uh, statements about that or feelings. I would just like to see the exact dimensions of every every one of those uh, spaces. If I may. Yes. Uh, the suggestion, um, I know that area very well. I lived on First Avenue for many years. If the if you you might want to put some kind of th- give some thought to controlling the backing out so that when they back out they can only go east and then go down and go over to bond and come around as right a going across that easterly lane into the westerly lane as somebody comes down that little bit of a hill there they might not see them that could you you're you're spot on there jack okay so you might want to consider that as well Makes it a lot easier to make that to get out of there by backing to the left and then going to the right. I think that I think that's a that's a. I was thinking of that myself, but I just didn't didn't articulate it that way. Because <laughs> you would want to go east. You don't want anyone to go west if you're backing out. Yep. Yeah, you can always go around Bond and go west down Asbury Avenue, and off you go. Mm. All right. I'm in agreement with that. Um, anybody else from the planning board that want to uh, provide any other advice or things that they would like to see next time before we uh, sign off? No? Okay. All right, then, um, uh, Mr. Beekman, we have our next. Uh, I don't know if you'll be um, ready, but our next opening is May 17th. Dan or uh, Matt, any comments? Is that tight? Because the next, but remember, just just remember that once they're created, our professionals also need time to comment on them. Yep. So the next one after that is June twenty first. The engineer is always the bad guy in this circumstance. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could probably make it work. <laughs> but will you have it in time for our professionals to be able yeah, I mean, to do their work? We're talking about having in by May seventh. We're only talking two weeks away, two and a half weeks away. Oh, uh, I'll I'll put the knife in my back. I, I would need the extra time, yeah, I, to make sure that we were able to give the professionals adequate time um, so. to review the the revisions. And we just we need a little more time to see if we can get those utility will serve letters and, and those things as well. I think 621 makes a lot more sense. Okay, so can I get a motion to carry this application without notice to June 21st? If I may. Yes, uh, you may. Mr. Beekman, uh, you yes. waive any time constraints imposed by the MLUL within which time we would have to act? We absolutely would, yes. Thank you. I am so moved, this is Eric. And Alexis. Jim Henry, I'll second. I think Alexis beat you to the punch on that one, Jim. Yep, that's okay by me. <laughs> and, okay. And, I'd, and I'd also just like take a moment to apologize to the public that it, it, I think it really makes sense for us to have all the questions come at the same time with the new plans because there are so many revisions that we're asking for. So uh, I apologize, but I, I, the redundancy just... It just wouldn't make sense. But thank you all for coming. Um, you need a vote? You want, me, you want me to run the vote? I don't think. Uh, go. 
Uh, Irene is here. Okay. Uh, I'll go by my screen. Uh, Rick Lambert. Yes. Uh, Jim Henry. Yes. Uh, Eric Alipo. Yes. Uh, Barbara Krizak. Yes. Alexis Taylor. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. And Jennifer Souter. Yes. Matters carried. <clears throat> pardon me to June 21st at 7 p.m. without further notice. Okay. Um, can I get a, uh, a motion to adjourn? Can I, can I just Jim ask Henry, one question, so Ms. Kurzak, first? Oh, oh sure. sure. I'm sorry. Uh, can, I, can we just ask if any board members who were not there tonight, if it's possible for them to listen to the tapes? Sure. We, we will ask, that, ask them to do so. Um, and uh, we'll let you know who has completed it by the 21st. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback. Have a good evening. Sure. Okay. We have a mo uh, someone made a motion to adjourn? Yeah, Jim Henry. Okay, you got that one, Jim. Who's the second? Jennifer Souter. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Any opposed? Hearing no opposition, the ayes have it. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, Good night everyone. All.